Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. David, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Would you like to introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Hi, Robbie. My name's David Whelan. I'm a UK-based TV producer and writer. Um, and for the past three years, I've been investigating John Lennon's murder. Why John Lennon? Like, what, what, what sparked up the interest? It's a really good question. Uh, I had no previous uh, interest in John Lennon's murder up until 2020 for 40 years like most people on the planet, I just thought it was an open and shut case. I thought uh, the guy who did it was a lone nut, the old classic lone nut. And he shot John for various strange reasons because he was a lone nut. And he stayed on, stayed at the scene when the police turned up. He gave himself up and said, yep, I did it. And he's now been in jail for the last 40 odd years. So I, I, for me, it, it, you know, it was as clear cut as it comes, really. I, I wasn't a massive John Lennon fan in my life. Um, when John Lennon was assassinated in 1980, I was only 14 years old and um, I wasn't into John Lennon's music. He'd only just recently brought a new album out after, you know, just before he got assassinated. And it's a good album, Double Fantasy, but it's, it, it wasn't cutting edge for 1980. There was a lot of echoes to his previous Beatles rock and roll stuff. Uh, so for me, you know, a kid in 1980, I was into things like XTC and the jam and Blondie and sort of new wave stuff. John Lennon was just this old dinosaur, really, to be honest with you. In fact, I'll be brutally honest with you, Robbie. I didn't even know who he was <laughs> when he got assassinated. I just remember going to school that day and looking at all these uh, newspapers on the buses and the trains and everyone was kind of John Lennon shot, John Lennon dead. And I, I vividly remember thinking to myself, who's John Lennon? Um, of course, I love music and anybody who loves music eventually comes across the Beatles and comes across John Lennon's work. And you realize, you know, he was an absolute genius as were the Beatles. And, you know, you can't love music and not love the Beatles. And, and what was fascinating about John was, I've of course come to discover is that, you know, he was a man who stood up for his principles and he was, you know, he was very much a, a peace activist who, who put himself on the line. And when he did all that back in the early seventies, after the Beatles broke up, he got a lot of ridicule for it. So it was a very brave thing to do. Uh, it'd be a very brave thing to do now, actually. I actually can't think of anybody. Is that because the number of people that supported the Vietnam War, surprisingly, I don't know why, like there's became this thing that everyone was against the Vietnam War. And that wasn't really true. There was a lot of people that were kind of for the Vietnam War. But then you had certain uh, later when John Lennon and Bob Dylan and other people started speaking out about the whole war efforts and everything like that. Then people kind of started to hop on board. I have dived into the counterculture movements and obviously things of that sort. But a lot of the general public is kind of like, anything that comes up now that should be like a big story, like anything about JFK that comes up, everyone's kind of like, oh, cool. And then they kind of just walk across. It's like, you no, know, you should care about that. So I'm curious if that was a lot of the ridicule, ridicule, because I know people blame the government, like a lot of people that think the government killed John Lennon um, because of the Vietnam War activism, which I would believe, because if you look at like COINTELPRO and a number of programs they did back then, Hey, man, they don't, you know, I, I don't put it against them or I don't say like, oh, they definitely wouldn't do anything like that. They definitely got it in their arsenal to, you know, kill somebody that would be speaking out against against their war efforts. But that we might get into that. I don't know. Yeah, we will. I'm sure we will. I mean, he was I think that a lot of the ridicule come from the way he did it, Robbie. He, he did things called bed ins where he just basically spent a few days, possibly even a week in a bed with his new wife, Yoko Ono. Who, uh, who wasn't a woman who was taken by Beatles fans to their hearts because there was, I think wrongly she was accused of breaking up the Beatles. The research that I've done, they were pretty much finished by the time she came up on the scene and, and they kind of done all they had to do and they were creative and spent as a foursome. Obviously they did a lot of great stuff with solo artists. But I, I think it was just the fact he was doing it with this strange lady called Yoko Ono. It was the fact he was doing these things like bed-ins and he was growing his hair for peace. and. He, he was making up lots of different slogans. And, and, and I think people were like, John, you know, the Beatles, I don't think they could quite cope with the fact that the Beatles was, were, were gone. And then what replaced the Beatles was John in bed with a strange lady. I just think they just found that too much to take. And, and, and sadly, I think the message got lost, i.e. we should be talking about peace and not war, which is a message that for me resonates right up to this present day. Uh, so it, I think... Now, I think people can look back and go, yeah, it was a brave thing he did and he didn't need to stand up against uh, against war and against, you know, speak out against the Vietnam War and speak out against you know, a massive crit uh, a critic of religion he was at the time. Capitalism, obviously, Imagine is seen as some kind of socialist parable, some sort of socialist poem. I don't see Imagine that way, but you can see how it could be interpreted that way. So he was kind of, I think, perceived as an anti-religion, anti-capitalist, anti-war guy. So 
you can imagine if you've got those three things on your ledger, there's going to be a lot of dangerous people who are not going to like you. Um, so he, you know, it's more about not not who killed John Lennon, but who 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 actually didn't want to kill him. I think there was a lot of people in power who were behind the military industrial complex and all the wars and horrible things that have happened since JFK's assassination in 63, who would have despised John Lennon. And I, th- I think if you can throw in some religious fundamentalism into that as well, uh, you know, I think they, they, he was a guy that would have been target number one. I think the problem with John is he was, if you talk to the people who grew up with him and, and were around at the time when the Beatles were, were doing their thing, the word that keeps coming out with John Lennon is he was reckless. He, he really was a rebel and he, he kind of put himself out there many times with the things he said and the things he did. And, and that was great for his art because he would come out with things like I'm the walrus and tomorrow never knows, just these incredible, strange new sounds that no one had heard of before. But when you, when you start saying things like we're bigger than Jesus, which was a kind of throwaway line that he gave to a friend. Uh, who was also a journalist, and it, it, that line got lost, but it got resurrected by some southern radio jocks who used it to, you know, further their own fame. And of course, then you had that horrible burning of Beatles records, and it was all a bit like uh, echoes of Nazi time burning the books. You know, it was all very, very disturbing how they were the kind of southern media flipped that that quote and tried to make John out to be the Antichrist. And there's some really disturbing YouTube videos of young people in the South just talking about how they're so proud that they're burning these records and destroying all their Beatles memorabilia because of that one phrase. And, you know, it's John, it, as far as I can see, that was a throwaway phrase. But if you look at John Lennon's record, and if you go through his ledger from when he became famous in 62, right up until he died, he consistently criticised religion and he consistently promoted peace. And I think those two things were very dangerous uh, things to do in combination. Um, but getting back to how I got into all this, Robbie, um, I, I kind of, like I said, up until 2020 for 40 years, I, I, I just thought John Lennon's murder was an open and shut case. But I, I should roll back a little bit. I, I've got Irish heritage and I've got Irish parents and I spent a lot of time in Ireland when I was a child. And one of the pictures that I always, one of my earliest memories is seeing a picture on the wall of some of my uncles and aunts' homes of JFK, this you know black and white picture of JFK, which would be next to Jesus and would be next to the Pope. There'd be this kind of, always this trio of images that I can remember on the walls. And I wasn't too bothered about the Pope and Jesus, but I remember thinking, who's that? Who's that guy? Who's that handsome guy? And, you know, my family used to say, oh, that's, you know, the Irish president of America far removed from being Irish, to be honest with you. He had roots. Second, third generation. Yeah, he had roots. yeah, definitely had roots, second, third generation. But to them, Ireland are very proud of JFK and they still are to this day. And obviously he visited Ireland and he's seen as a, as a, as a great figure in Ireland. So that, that kind of was put into me from a very young age. This was a great man who did great things. And then fast forward to 1991, uh, I went to see the Oliver Stone film, JFK, not knowing what that film was about. But I thought it'd just be a, a by-the-numbers JFK biog, to be honest with you. And then when I went in to see that film and that three-hour film, just two and a half hours, just rolled out in front of me, uh, it, was, it was my red pill moment. I came out of there and thought, oh, my God, that's, there's just so much compelling stuff in here. I'm not sure all of this is true, but a lot of it seems true to me. And after that point, I just went out and started to research the JFK assassination with gusto. Uh, and by that point in 91, there was a lot of 60s and 70s books that had been written about the JFK assassination, some really good ones, some really bad ones. You've, you've been on that road, Robbie. You know what it's like? It's a deep, deep rabbit hole, the JFK assassination. And you can go down some very bad rabbit holes. And you can go down some very interesting rabbit holes. But it, it, it fostered a, an interest in me in assassinations that hasn't gone away. And, of course, anyone who gets into the JFK assassination is going to start to research the RFK assassination, the Martin Luther King assassination, right the, yeah, Malcolm X, you know, and, and there's connections to all of them. And they're all men of peace. They're all men that tried to, uh, they're all radical men who, who, who looked to do some change in the world. And I think there's no doubt there's a thread between all of them. And John Lennon, I would put in that camp, I think he was a guy who was dangerous to the establishment. And, and uh, I think he was taken out because of that. But again, you know, up until 2020, Robbie, I had no interest in the case. I wasn't a massive John Lennon fan. You know, I liked his music. I liked the Beatles music, but didn't, you know, I wasn't an obsessive. But then um, it all changed in 2020 when um, when the lockdowns happened across the globe. Um, I was uh, literally just out walking my dog, uh, listening to a podcast, a podcast that I'm sure you're, you're aware of, Black Ops Radio. 
which is the kind of JFK uh, assassination podcast. Like yourself, they focus on the JFK assassination a lot. And I was listening to that podcast, Walking the Dog in a Wet Field, and uh, it was probably spring 2020. And someone mentioned on that podcast, just in passing, that the doorman at the Dakota when John Lennon was assassinated might have been a CIA operative who, who was at the Bear Pigs. And my ears just pricked up, and I'd never heard this before. And I just thought, well, if that's true, that will be very, very interesting. And because it was locked down and I had no work to do and everything was put on pause, I went home that day and just thought, you know what, I've got some time on my hands. Let's just look into this. And um, from that day onwards, everything changed. I, I just started to get deeper and deeper into the case. And uh, I haven't looked back, really. It's been three years. It's been an incredible journey. Um, and, yeah, it, there's, there's a lot to say about it. It's, it's not an open and shut case. I want to ask about it not being an open shut case, but it was interesting to me that you had an interest originally in the JFK assassination. Did you come to the same conclusion that Oswald did it? Like I try and stay away from the who, but I just try and like what my whole purpose is right now is that here's what they said in 63 and here's what we know now. And it's a hell of a lot of a different story. I mean, I've had Blakey on the show from the HSCA on here to say that the CIA lied to him. So like it's the first time in like 60 years, I know he stated it like in private interviews and, you know, off air discussions on things, but he stated this one publicly and looking at the documentation, I just try and tell people like, we just look at it as a president, which makes it think like, it's gotta be like the lone assassin. There's no conspiracy like this or no military industrial complex connections, which is interesting. Cause I'm drawing connections with the RFK and the John Lennon stuff when it comes to just the simple thing of how come people didn't raise more questions? How wasn't there this big thing, this giant thing? And they weren't a president. They were just, whether it's a celebrity or not, it was just a different kind of attitude, even though I'm sure people had their skepticism and stuff. But I don't know, like to me, the whole political assassination thing, once I understood that that was like a tactic they used in other countries and obviously through all the research on the JFK stuff. I mean, I'm curious, did you come to the same conclusion that Lee Harvey Oswald did it, or you think that this is, obviously there's evidence of a cover-up, that's not even a question, but it's about the whole, you know, Oswald yeah. scenario. I mean, I, I don't think Oswald did it, I think he might have been involved, I think he might have been the patsy that was an active patsy, um, I, I, I don't actually think he shot a gun, I, I think he was working for the CIA, I think, um, I think the, the fact that the CIA are not releasing any records, or still holding back some records, to me, that that says it all. It's an well, open. They show. ended the JFK Act. They uh, that sixty year act. They ended it and said no more. We don't have to give you any more documents. Nothing to hide. Well, why, <laughs> why not? Why not release them if there's nothing to hide? So clearly, they have something to hide. Uh, I think Alan Dallas is possibly the mastermind behind it. I think that it's not difficult to see him as as a guy who would have the motive. And obviously, he was a guy who was incredibly on the Warren Report. Uh, and you know, is part of the Warren Report heading it up and. He made sure that report came out the way it did. I'm sure. Um, so yeah, for me, it's it's it was a it was a conspiracy. I think it was a coup. I think the Western world has never been the same since '63. I think we've gone on a dark path ever since, uh, where the military-industrial complex and intelligence agencies rule the roost. Um, I think the media have been co-opted mostly um, into this new paradigm after '63. And um, I think it's uh, it's one of the most important events in, in modern history, really. And, and I, I think with regards to Lenin, um, they, I think there are clear parallels. And we'll get, we'll get there, there's definitely a line to the CIA. There's definitely a line to, to Richard Nixon. There's definitely a line to uh, you could you could once once you actually know all the all the actual truth and the evidence and you can get, get into how it really went down and not how we were told it went down. It was clearly an operation and it was an operation that was quite effectively put into place. It was quite effectively covered up. And to this very day, it's been uh, very effectively sold uh, as a don't look, you know, don't look over there, look over here. This is a very neat package. You don't need to look too deeply. But if you actually study all of the books and magazine articles and documentaries and films that have come out about the John Lennon murder, they all are different. They all are. They're very, very loose on the how. And they're very, very loose on the why. They'll tell you where. They'll say it was at the Dakota. It was on Monday, the December the 8th at 10.45 p.m. at night. And the, Mark Chapman was there and John and Yoko were there. But they don't go into detail about how it went down. And that was probably the first thing I, as I started to research this, that was probably the first thing I thought, well, this is, 
this is a red flag here because this is one of the most famous men who ever lived. So surely his murder should be one of the most well-documented events in history. But excuse me, it's really not well-documented. It's really not well understood. And I think most people just think, oh, there must have been multiple witnesses. Yoko must have seen it all. Mark Chapman admitted it. You know, it, it, he was shot getting out of the limo. The police must have investigated it because he was such an important person. The press must have really looked into it carefully because he was John Lennon. But none of these things are true. It, it wasn't investigated properly. The media just were asleep at the wheel. It's just shocking how they didn't ask really basic questions like, where were the entrance wounds? Where were the exit wounds? Where was John positioned exactly when he was shot? Where was Chapman positioned exactly when he was shot? All of these things, which are crucial to understand an event like this, should have been asked right off the bat. But the media were asleep at the wheel. The media were basically told very early on by the NYPD, this guy did it. He was a crazy lone nut. I think they called him, what did they call him? Uh, something along those lines of a kind of uh, nut, a nut job kind of thing. Uh, out of town nut job. Um, and he just kind of like got a bit obsessed with John, wanted to be famous, killed John to be famous. Terrible shocking event. Let's quickly move on. Let, let, let's, let's all hold a candle. Let's all, let's all sing Imagine and let's all tap into our emotions about how much John Lennon meant to us. And this process of just not thinking but feeling happened almost instantly after the murder. It happened the night of the murder, the morning after, and weeks, months afterwards, all these saccharine tributes and these dreadful, you know, uh, Lennon ballads that were just put on 24-7. And, and everybody just emoting and just feeling so sad and so angry that this loser took away our beloved John. But nobody, absolutely nobody was saying, OK, can you just explain to us exactly how this went down? And can you just explain to us why this guy did this? Because I'm hearing different things. I'm hearing things like Catherine the Rye was involved. I'm hearing things like he wanted to be famous. I'm hearing things about demons. I'm hearing things about he had a big part in him and a small part in him. What's the deal? But nobody did this. They all just kind of went, oh, yeah, he's a crazy guy. He kind of liked catching the rye, but he admitted it. So he's in jail. We'll listen to Imagine again. We'll hold a candle every year and we'll just move on. And, and it's funny, you know, when I broke this story, Robbie, uh, in the Mail Online, I think it was April this year, April 20, 2023, I got an awful lot of comments. You can imagine I got an awful lot of negative comments, people saying, how dare I bring up this case? And I'm, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's dreadful that I could do this when the family are still alive. And, you know, how dare I question and bring up this awful event? And, you know, they're, you know, bring, raking over these old coals, you know, just put it to bed. We've got the guy. Why are you doing this, you horrible man? And it's kind of like John Lennon, if he was about anything, if he was obsessed about anything, it was the word truth. He was really into truth. And he kept on self-analyzing himself and trying to get to who he was and what he did and why he did it. Very self-critical, uh, obsessed with the truth. He often used to move around different ideologies and used to come out with different, wildly different statements about different things because he was always reading and looking to find the truth of things. And it's so ironic that people are saying that a way to... Uh, pay tribute to John and, and, you know, uh, and to actually, you know, keep his name up there is to not question his murder at all, is to just accept how the murder has been given to us by the NYPD, the DA's office and the media. And if there are any anomalies, to look into those anomalies is somehow disrespectful, which is, to me, I think quite telling of modern society. I think people are very uncomfortable now. Um, not uh, looking at looking at narratives anew and asking questions about anything, regardless of how strange and, and mysterious it is. And this is a new phenomenon, Robbie, because I I first started in television in 1983 in London. I started to work for a TV company called Thames Television. And in those days, I was obviously a very junior guy. I was a trainee in the film department and I became a researcher and I gradually worked my way up. But in those early days, I was watching older experienced producers put together documentaries for 10 television. They had a really good documentary uh, department and they often used to put out a documentary, would you believe, every week, a one hour documentary about something. And what was interesting in those days, Robbie, was 
when they did a documentary, it had to be about something. It had to ask a question about something. It couldn't just be a, a, a kind of established narrative that they were just going to bolster. So it couldn't be something like, oh, here's this horrible guy. And we're going to do it who you know is a horrible guy. I mean, you know he's a bad person. And we're going to do a documentary about him, showing how, what a horrible guy he is. And you're all just going to get what you think affirmed and what you've been told affirmed. We're going to put some cool music on it. We're going to give you some cool archive. But one thing we're never going to do is ask a question or try to kind of get you to think that maybe the way you've been presented this person or this event or this this thing is not how it was presented. And, and there's actually another way to see it, another way to look at it. So in those days, when I when I first started in television in the 80s and definitely in the 70s, this was the case, they a documentary had to say something and it had to have a point to it nowadays every single documentary on netflix amazon across the board they, they look great they're really slick and you go wow that's amazing where do they get that archive from and this music's really cool and the edits are really fast and sexy but when you come away from it and go well yeah i kind of knew all that before i started watching that was kind of the, the known narrative to whatever they're whatever they're featuring what did I learn new from that? Where, where, where is that? Where am I being challenged here? Where is it? Where are the questions? And that just doesn't happen anymore. So I think that's the problem with my the the initial reaction to my John Lennon investigation and my John Lennon revelations, which we're about to go over, and people's anger towards it. I think people have been conditioned not to ask questions anymore, and I think they've been conditioned to see people who ask questions as that classic phrase that Alan Dulles very cleverly invented, a conspiracy theorist. And, and that, that, that powerful magic spell phrase just can shut down the most experienced producer, writer, investigator, journalist, because and I've seen it in people. I've seen it in senior producers' eyes, in television, especially a medium that I work in. When they feel something is being done that might be called a conspiracy theory, they shut down. I can, I can see the absolute rabid fear in their eyes because they'll feel they're going to be somehow ridiculed and they won't be taken seriously and they'll be thrown in with, you know, flat earthers or QAnon or whatever's your conspiracy theory that you think's mad. And they'll, th they'll think, because what's really clever about that phrase is there is no kind of, um, it's, it's all one. It's all homogenous. It's so an umbrella conspiracy term. Yeah, yeah, you believe you believe if you're if you believe that conspiracy theorist, you believe all conspiracy theories. So clearly, you're just a crazy guy, and let's just move on. I'm not going to listen to anything you're going to say because what you're saying is slightly different to the official narrative. Conspiracy theorists. So clearly, you're mad. Um, and of course, not all conspiracy theories are equal. Just like not all religions are equal. Just like all you know, it, everything is is nuanced, and everything is different. And I think with that with that paradigm that we're in now. I think people need to need to actually step up to the mark, Robbie, to be honest with you, and stop being such cowards and just accept that if they do question something, regardless of what it is, they will be called by some people a conspiracy theorist. They will get that tinfoil hat crap thrown at them. And they've just got to accept it and move move past it, especially journalists and documentary filmmakers. Just just have have a pair and just get out there and 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 you know say what you think and put it on the line and be, you know be, be, because that's what john lennon did he, he wasn't frightened to question things and i think people need to do that more now and i i hope i have noticed actually robbie since april since the initial backlash that i got from bring, bringing this investigation out into the open into the mainstream media people are beginning more and more now to see more and more of my interviews and read more and more of my documentation and read my substack and they're beginning to see the evidence at first hand for themselves. And I am seeing a definite sea change where people are going, actually, do you know what? He's got some evidence here. He's got some questions that need answering. And I am beginning to see a slow sea change. But I don't expect the masses that have been programmed to only believe in official narratives to get on board anytime soon. But that's, to be honest with you, Robbie, that's not really the point. The point is... I have to look at myself in the mirror and say, I found some stuff out. It didn't make sense. It was about an important event. I need to get it out to the public. And then I'll let the public make up their own mind. Well, wait till you get super popular and they start shadow banning you and doing everything they possibly can to make sure that you 
are basically not on the internet at all. That's the that's the evolution of just people's criticism. It becomes just the all the main system platforms realize how everything is so connected in there. I swear, once I got one strike on YouTube, it's like I step in a spider web every time something happens now. And it's like I have had JFK videos flagged for national security. I'm like, you guys release a document, I show it on air. I also state in the document there's a certain one I show that's pretty popular, but it was about um. A woman had overheard a bunch of CIA officers talking in like the lunchroom at the CIA intelligence office and had talking about Kennedy needed to be dealt with within the next five years. Um, she said upon returning after her lunch or whatever, the CIA guy stopped talking. And then she was called down to an army medical facility where she was told to receive a polio inoculation. And upon receiving the shot, the doctor stated that she would forget everything. I have showed this on air. If you have a TikTok, go to my TikTok. You'll be able to find it and see where I clipped the exact part of what it says. I was just reading from the document and I literally stated afterward, I don't know what the hell to do with that. But she, the lady, she didn't remember anything. Even the, she remembered, I think, months later about getting a shot. But just the words that the doctor said, and nothing after that. And I was like, they released that in the twenty one release, and the next thing you know, I'm getting flagged for national security. I'm like, you don't get any incentive for saying the truth or just trying to find out what the truth is. You get an incentive by if you play the game. And sadly, every journalist now has become playing the game. The only ones I've been able to find with any respect to them are ones that are independent, do it on their own, have to put all their stuff on a sub stack. But I'm like, then you're even, your views are limited, which sucks because a major platform that you would think would want a scoop of a story, especially who killed John Lennon. I don't even think it's that controversial, but that I'm sure we'll get into about um, who might've been in charge or who might've been the person. Mm, you know, sure. Sure. No, that's a good point, that. Robbie. You're right. Shadow banning is a thing for sure. We're living in a very sensorial, you know, time. Um, everything's controlled. Uh, official narratives are the only things that are accepted. It's, it's disappointing. I think all we can do, as I say, is just that look yourself in the mirror thing, Robbie, you know, you need to, at the end of the day, say, I tried, I tried to get this information out. Obviously, the mainstream media, uh, I think the problem with the mainstream media is some, some have embraced it. Some, you know, some big newspapers, mainly tabloid, have, have, have covered my story. I think the problem with the broadsheets, the intellectual papers, uh, is for them to suddenly say, actually, do you know what? This Whelan guy, he's kind of, he's coming up with some really interesting stuff here. Maybe we got it wrong. Maybe the official John Lennon narrative is wrong. That's kind of admitting that for 42 years, they were hoodwinked. And I don't think their egos will allow them to do that. And I think there's also this, this kind of, as I say about the conspiracy thing, there's a cowardice involved. You know, it basically comes down to cowardice. It's really hard to stand up and, and say to the masses, you've been sold a lie. Here's the truth. Here's the proof of the truth, that this new evidence I'm bringing you. Digest it and see what you think. And most people can't. It, it's just easy to, to quote Pink Floyd. It's always a lovely song. It's easy to be comfortably numb, Robbie. You know, it's just life's better when you're comfortably numb, to be honest. Um, I sometimes bliss. it is, you know, I sometimes wonder whether I, that, that JFK 91 Oliver Stone film red pill that moment I got, would my life be better if I just didn't have that red pill moment and I was just, you know, just blissfully. I got to watch that, that movie at some point. I'm telling you, <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen it It's a good film. It it's a good film. It's, it's very compelling. They didn't get it all right. It was a long time ago and there's a lot of new evidence has come out now about the JFK assassination since 91. But Oliver got his, he got his, uh, he got over the target quite a few times, I think. And um, there's a lot in there that makes you think, wow, that's, that, that really is, that really is incredible. Um, and of course, what's really amazing about the JFK assassination is, is we have a piece of film, Robbie, right? That to my eyes, to my very sort of, you know, non-expert eyes, shows a man being shot in the front of his head, right? As, as Garrison famously said, back and to the left, okay? Clearly, he's being shot in the front. But we're, if you go on Wikipedia, they will still tell you to this day that he was shot in the back by Lee Harvey Oswald with a crap rifle. A guy, you know, three shots in a million that somehow the bullets did all this. Well, then you got the conspiracy that probably stemmed from Dan Rather and his PBS special where um, the guy said, it looks like the head goes back and to the left when they were showing it on air in the special. And Dan Rather goes, oh, you don't know if Jackie Kennedy could have just pushed uh, Kennedy back at the last moment as a reaction to the thing. And I was like, that's why everyone thinks Jackie did it or the driver or whatever you want to say. The interesting thing about that is I didn't know there are 10 films, um, not just the Zapruder film. 
There's the Gail Nix who just won her lawsuit to get her grandfather's film back. And there's like nine other ones you can find on YouTube and they don't show anything as much as the Zapruder film does. They stop either before the assassination happens or it starts after. And it's like, well, where's the middle section? And you do have a number of witnesses that took photographs that they got their photos confiscated um, by FBI. So whether that's a threat to national security, I don't know. But I've talked to the people that have seen in the archives and like there's no camera devices in there. So whether that was destroyed or not, um, you know, it's, it, it brings up bigger questions on things. You know, I'm big into the JFK thing, but, you know, two shooters is not crazy. I just the thing I used to get the public on board with the conspiracy talk, because the number of people that will just roll their eyes at me when I start talking about JFK. Is that why within 48 hours would you eliminate eliminate the idea of there being a getaway driver or anything like that? It had to be Lee Harvey Oswald, and that was it. Wrap it up tight with a bow. And I was like, it just why would you do that within 48 hours? It doesn't make sense. And then usually people start going, yeah, I guess I can get with that. But even some of the giant skeptics, the big guys out there that try and debunk stuff, they don't include everything. You know, I've had Michael well, they, they, Shermer that, on here. It. That's what they do, Robbie. It, it, it's not what they say, it's what they don't say. It's the stuff that they don't want to go anywhere near, which is a big thing about the Lennon thing. There's been two journalists who we'll get onto later who basically have controlled, well, I say one's a journalist, one I think is a fake journalist, but we won't go into that. But two people, shall I say, who have controlled the John Lennon murder narrative for 42 years. One did it for something like 18 years, 17, 18 years. And the other guy picked up the baton and did it right up until the present day. And these guys are in on every single documentary. They're in every single book being quoted, every single magazine article. And these two guys were just literally given a free reign to give you the whole narrative over and over again. They always crop up these two guys. But what, what they don't do is they don't go anywhere near the medical. They don't touch. They don't ever discuss the medical stuff. They don't ever touch the specifics of where Chapman was and where John was and where the bullets were. It's all about the kind of sexy stuff, the kind of, oh, he had capturing their eye on him and, oh, he wanted to be famous and, oh, look at him. Isn't he fat? Doesn't he look weird? And uh, he's got all these strange things going on in his head and, oh, he's got a strange background and he used to listen to Beatles records backwards. Yeah. Pray to the, pray to devil, pray to Satan and the devil. Oh, so, yeah, salacious, isn't it? Salacious. Oh, Mark Chapman. But what they don't do is give you any specifics. And they haven't 42 years. They've, they've, and I've kind of analysed in two Substack articles exactly what they've said and exactly what they've not said. And it's what they haven't said that's really important. And just as you said earlier, it's the stuff they omit. But I think what might be useful at this point, Robbie, is if we go into a, a kind of rundown of, of the official narrative that John Lennon murder, for people who, who are not too au fait with the case, and then we'll break it down bit by bit and I'll try and um, explain why I believe the official narrative is is impossible, frankly, which is a very similar thing to the JFK assassination, really, and the, and the RFK. So the official narrative is this. You've got ex beastle John Lennon living in the Dakota with Yoko Ono, his wife, for the last 10 years. By 1980, they have, they're apparently a, a couple madly in love, but by all accounts, they're, they're kind of not, they're not really together much. Yoko, by some people's, well, people who were actually living with them at the time at the Dakota, I think she was having an affair. I think there is something to that. I don't think they were love's, you know, number one romance on the planet, but that was the way they sold themselves in an album that they brought out at the end of that year called Double Fantasy, which was an album uh, where they're both on the cover kissing famously. So you think, oh, John and Yoko, what a wonderful couple. I, I don't think they were, but the album sort of gave over that kind of, that kind of image. So leading up to the assassination, John and Yoko left the Dakota. I'm not going to go into all this Mark Chapman getting his album signed stuff. I just want to get down to the specifics of the murder. So basically, John and Yoko were in a recording studio called The Record Plant in New York, and they were recording a track. They were recording a Yoko track called Walking on Thin Ice. Uh, and they were there up until 10.30 p.m. at night on Monday night, very important, the actual night, Monday night, 10.30 Waiting outside the Dakota of their home was a guy called Mark Chat, right? Who's a guy, we'll go into Mark's background later on for sure, but he was a guy originally from Georgia, a southern, in, you know, a southern boy who then ended up in Hawaii via strange circumstances. And for some reason at the middle part in the summer of 1980, he became obsessed. He said he had a compulsion. He sometimes called it a runaway train desire to kill John Lennon. And this was all wrapped up in, in, 
uh, another obsession, which was the Catcher in the Rye book that he uh, got obsessed about in the summer of 1980 as well. So basically, he he went to cut a slightly long story short. He went in he went in late October, early November to kill John Lennon. Didn't do it. Spent three or four days scoping out the building, scoping out John Lennon. Flew back to Hawaii. Threw away his copy of Catcher in the Rye, which was interesting. Uh, threw away apparently his gun and bullets, but he didn't. He had he still had his gun and bullets. He then went back out in early December, scoped the building for three or four days, the Dakota outside, waiting for John, waiting for the right moment. But on the night of Monday, the 8th of December, 1980, the conditions were right. So if you think about Monday night, Robbie, it's it's Monday night football. So a lot of people are watching the big game. It's not the weekend. Uh, 10.45 is an interesting time uh, when the actual assassination apparently happened because it's kind of not before everybody comes out of the theatres and comes out of the bars. So it's that kind of, it's, it was a very interesting time they chose for it to be done. Um, 10.45 Monday. It certainly wouldn't have worked if it was a, a wild Saturday night with the, t- the streets teaming with people say at midnight. So anyway, that was that was the time. It was 10.30. John then says to Yoko at 10.30 p.m. at the record plant, I want to stop recording now. I'm tired. They've been there for five hours. And he said, I want to go home. But on the way home, he wanted to stop off at a deli called the Stage Deli, a very famous deli in New York at the time, which was on 77th Street. And this deli was on the way home. They had to pass it to get to the Dakota from the record park. So that was the last time the producer and the people working at the studio heard from John and Yoko. But they do recall John saying he was hungry and he was going to stop off at the deli. For some reason, they did not stop off at the deli, which we'll get into later. So what they did was they got in their, in their limo outside the record plant. It was a gray, long, uh, yellow, limo, uh, gray limousine. They drove to the Dakota. They pulled up outside the Dakota, which is where they lived, at roughly 1040, 1045. Now, we need to get the, geog- the geography right here. It's really important that people get their head around this. So the Dakota is a big Gothic building, but to get into where the, the Lennon's department was, you had to walk down a, a kind of cobblestone driveway with a, a kind of Gothic arch probably about 30 to 35 feet in length where you get to a kind of iron gate at the end of it. Just before you get to the iron gate at the end of it, on the right-hand side is a kind of glass door vestibule porch kind of device, which they brought out in the winter to stop the cold getting up the stairs into the, into the Dakota building. So that was fixed. So you had a kind of two door. It was a little bit like a kind of triangle shape. So you had one door there and one door there. And they had glass panels in the doors. When you get through that door, you have, then have to go up six steps. And then there's two mahogany doors, which you have to open up, very big mahogany doors. When you open those doors, you are then into the Dakota lobby area. OK, so imagine a hotel lobby, marble floor. On the left of that lobby is a big desk, big marble desk. And just beside that marble desk on the extreme left is a swinging door. And if you go through that swinging door, you can then obviously get behind the desk. But behind that desk is an open plan concierge's office, okay? And that's quite a big office. And there's a window in that concierge's office that is behind the vestibule doors that you could hear everything going on in the driveway. Beyond that concierge's office is another office, which was apparently open that night, okay? So you need to get that geography right. If you get back to the driveway now, You've got the vestibule doors at the far end on the right. You've also got another doorway on the left-hand side as you look at it, going down, looking down. Um, And that's a kind of alcove. And in there, you've got a lift, an elevator that goes down to the basement. Okay, so that's that's basically the geography. Now, Mark Chapman, the alleged killer, is at the foot, at the kind of mouth of the driveway. He's out by the sidewalk. He's out by the pavement. He's not anywhere in the kind of cobbled, area he's nowhere near the vestibule he's nowhere near the iron gates at the back he's he's by the street and we know this because various people id'd him there just before john lennon was shot and just after john lennon was shot so we we're pretty certain and even yoko owner herself has said i saw the guy by the gold by the doorman's gold booth now the doorman's gold booth was on the corner on the sidewalk of the of the driveway on the left hand side it's like a kind of gold cylinder kind of telephone box kind of thing where the doorman sat. So when the Lennons pulled up, there are only four people of interest that you need to know about. There's Mark Chapman, who's standing on the corner by the sidewalk. There's the doorman who would have opened the door of the limo, a guy called Jose Padermo, who we'll get into shortly, who let John and Yoko out of the car. There's the concierge in his concierge's office with his window open behind the vestibule doors, who could hear 
He could hear everything going on in the driveway. And he said he heard the Lennon's limo pull up. That's a guy called Jay Hastings, a very interesting guy. We'll get into him shortly. And there's another guy, important guy, a guy called Joseph Manny, who's a lift operator, who was down in the basement on the opposite side of the vestibule, down the lift shaft, sitting in the basement with two other co-workers who we don't really need to get into now, but there were two other people there. So you've got Dorman Jose Padermo, Mark Chapman, concierge Jay Hastings, and lift operator Joe Manny. They're the only people of real interest here. And you've obviously got John Lennon and Yoko Ono, okay? So the official narrative is this. Yoko Ono gets out of the limo first. This is up for debate, and we'll get into that as well. Yoko's given lots of different statements about where she was, but the official narrative says she gets out first. She walks past Chapman. She heads over to the far right-hand side, which is where the vestibule glass doors are, glass panel doors, because when you get into that lobby area, when you go through the vestibule up the stairs into the lobby, you can access your apartments beyond that. There's another door that the concierge buzzes open, and you can get access to stairs and elevators to all the apartments. So that's where she was going. And obviously she checks at the desk. Is there any, any parcels left for me? Any, any letters, or whatever, any messages? So that was always the way they went. There was, it was, there was nothing suspicious about them heading towards that area. 20, 25 feet behind Yoko, John gets out. So Yoko's probably quite close to the door by the time John gets out and starts walking past Mark Chapman. Now, according to Mark Chapman, and according to the official narrative of the NYPD, district attorney's office and the world's media to this very day when john is about 20 to 25 feet away from mark chapman facing away from mark heading towards the vestibule door according to mark just as he got to the door mark gets out a 0.38 revolver five cylinder chamber five bullet they call it a fiver you could put five bullets in there he gets his 0.38 out and he shoots john this is what Mark said to this very day. This is what Mark thinks happened five times. And he says four bullets hit John in the back and one bullet missed, according to Mark, which is a bit strange how he, he thought one bullet missed, but it, it was quite dark, quite dingy. John's 20, 25 feet away. But Mark is adamant that four bullets hit John in the back. If you go to Wikipedia to this very day, they say John was shot two times in the back and two times in the shoulder. So that kind of fits with what Mark Chapman thought happened. Um, Mark doesn't really remember what happened after that. He says often that, you know, after firing, he was surprised that the bullets were working, which is a strange thing to think. He doesn't remember pulling the hammer. He doesn't remember aiming. And he remembers thinking it was very strange that John just wasn't there. He, he, he kind of was expecting John to be splattered on the floor, but there was no John. So Mark just assumed that he kind of went on walking and he didn't quite see how he went on walking into the vestibule and up the stairs. Um, the official narrative is this. John got shot with four hollow point bullets, okay? The official, Mark Chapman has always said that he used hollow point bullets. He was given these bullets by a very nefarious man called Dana Reeves, who we can get into shortly. The hollow point bullets hit John in the back, and according to all the medical evidence and the people that I spoke to, there's one thing that is definitely not disputed, is that all the major arteries around John's heart were shattered. They were ripped apart and they were broken. There was because they were hollow point bullets, the bullets broke up inside John and his heart was actually intact, but all the arteries around his heart were, were, were just completely mashed up. So the official narrative wants you to believe that this has happened. John walks up to the vestibule door. He pulls the vestibule door open, walks into the vestibule. We don't know what Yoko is doing at the moment. We're assuming she's cowering down somewhere. He then walks up six fairly steep steps, gets to the mahogany doors, pulls the mahogany doors open, and they were always on an auto shutter. So he pulls those doors open, walks into the lobby area, turns left, goes through the swinging doors that are next to the um, desk area, says to the concierge, Jay Hastings, I've been shot, walks through Jay Hastings' rather large office, over to the right to another office with a door open and walks into that back office, they call it, the concierge's back office, walks a bit further into that, 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 um, that office and collapses face down and bleeds out. And the concierge, Jay Hastings, then says he runs towards John. He flips him over slightly and sees that his chest is covered in blood. He, tries to, he starts to take his tie off to use as a tourniquet, according to Jay Hastings, but he realized there was just too much blood and Jay Hastings thought there was no way my tie as a tourniquet is going to do any good here. Apparently Yoko then comes in very shortly after, 
and says, John's been shot, John's been shot, call an ambulance. And um, and Jay then says that, you know, he went to call an ambulance, but he realized that the actual emergency alarm had already been pressed, which he believed the doorman, Jose Padermo, did. Um, and that's basically it. That's the official narrative of what happened to John after he'd been shot, okay? Which is a fantastical feat, really. It's almost Jesus Christ, love me, do good God. Yeah, you thought zombies was uh, was not a real thing, but the zombie of John Lennon was doing some incredible things. Because here's the thing, Robbie, I'll get straight to this point. I've spoken to the doctors and nurses, or I'll get to in a minute, about what happened to John and what his condition was. The actual doctors and nurses who treated John, not not the ones who lied and said they did. And they all said one thing absolutely clearly: the second John was hit with those bullets, with those wounds. He was down. He was dead. He was on the floor, finished. I've also I've also got quotes from a doctor called Stephen Lynn who said he treated John, but we know he was in the room, so he saw the wounds as well. He was the head of the ER. He's the guy that you see on the uh, videos outside the hospital saying John Lennon's dead. He said multiple times he was dead on impact. The minute those bullets hit him, he was dead. Even if he was shot in a cardiac department of a hospital, they still couldn't have saved him. He died instantly. There's also a very nefarious little character called Elliot Gross is a chief medical officer who's had multiple accusations of falsifying autopsies. He's the guy who did the autopsy on John Lennon. Even he said that death came very shortly after John was shot. So we can be certain that this magical mystery tour of John going through vestibules upstairs, through doors, up, up into a concierge's area, through a swinging door, through one office, into it, it's just when I when I told this to the doctors and nurses who weren't really sure of what happened to John when he was shot, they just remember trying to save his life. They they almost found it comical. They just said not only was he not in a position to talk to anybody, he probably walked one two steps and would have instantly collapsed. You know, blood the, the blood loss was extensive. He it was there was just mass blood loss instantly, and of course he wouldn't be able to breathe, never alone talk. So. That's the first real big anomaly. So let, let's get let's just let's just part John in this back office for now. Let's get back out onto the vestibule itself, the the, um, the driveway, and Mark Chapman and Jose Padermo, the doorman. So according to the official narrative, Jose Padermo walks up to Chapman and says, "Do you know what you've just done?" And allegedly, Mark Chapman says, "I think Mark Chapman has said this. I've just shot John Lennon," which is a very strange thing for someone to say. It's almost like a kind of program response thing going on there. Somehow, Chapman's not sure how, we don't have Padermo's statement, which we'll get into in a minute, but somehow a gun is on the floor in the driveway. Mark doesn't know where his gun was, by the way. After gunfire, he says he looked down and kind of remembered having a book in his hand. He didn't even remember having a gun in his hand after gunfire. So let, but let's just say that was Mark's gun that was dropped on the floor. Some people say Jose shook it out of Mark's hand. But what we do know is Jose allegedly kicked the gun to the back of the driveway, okay, where the vestibule door was and where the, where the iron gates were. So if he kicked it to the back of the driveway, we can be pretty sure that Mark was at the front of the driveway, which we know anyway. So then what Jose did was he then walks up to the gun that he's kicked to the back of the driveway and he starts walking around it. He starts pacing around it in a very agitated state. Mark at this point decides that he wants to take his coat off, take his hat off, uh, open up his Catcher in the Rye novel and start reading it, which is the state he was in when the NYPD turned up. He's just, just a docile guy standing there reading a book. OK, but what was another thing that Jose said to Mark was, and this has been well reported, Jose said to Mark, get out of here, go, just leave. Now, this is apparently he said this to Mark after the gun had been kicked. He was in a big hurry, Jose, for Mark to run. But. Mark didn't run. Mark stood there and read his novel. So you've got Jose, you've got Mark at the sidewalk um, part of the of the driveway reading a novel in a docile fashion. You've got Jose and the gun walking around the gun in an agitated state. Why Jose didn't pick the gun up, we still don't know. You've got Yoko Ono, Jay Hastings, and John Lennon's probably dead body in the back office of the concierge's area. Then you've got another player turns up into the scene. This is Joe Manny, the lift operator. Now, Joe's down in the basement, okay? He hears gunfire. He says he hears three shots, which is strange, but he says he heard three. He comes up into the driveway to see what's going on with two co-workers, a guy called Joe Grezik and Victor Cruz. When they get to the driveway, they see Jose walking around the gun. 
and they say, what's up, Jose? And he says, oh, that guy's just shot John Lennon. Quick, take this gun and take it down to the basement and hide it because I don't want this guy, this docile guy reading the book to pick it up and start firing it again. So they decide, uh, Joe Manny says, and Victor Cruz and Joe Grezik, I've got their witness statements. They said they, they saw Joe do this. He picked the gun up himself with his hands. Him and Joe and Victor went down in the lift, down in the elevator, put the alleged gun of Mark Chapman, though no one's ever seen the gun actually on Mark Chapman, in a drawer, and they come back up to the driveway. Okay. Now, Joe Manny says he then went into the concierge's area and saw John in the back office. We've also got another witness, a guy called Jack Henderson, who lived in the Dakota, who said he saw Jose, uh, he saw Joseph Manny there. He saw John in the back office. He saw Yoko and he saw Jay Hayes. So we know we've got those guys there pretty much after the murder. Jose Padermo allegedly came into the office by some accounts. Sometimes he's, some accounts say he didn't. He stayed out in the driveway. Joe, uh, Victor Cruz and Joe Grezik go up to um, go up to Mark Chapman and apparently Victor Cruz starts to have an argument with Mark Chapman probably about why did you shoot this guy because obviously that's what Victor would have assumed happened at this point the cops turn up so you've got Stephen Spiro Officer Spiro and Officer Cullen they're the first two cops on the scene okay one really strange thing is they both say that a member of the public was seen running out of the driveway saying to them there's a man shooting in there now, what's really strange about this is Spiro and Cullen have never said who that man was. Cullen has just said, well, it must have been a member of the public. He looked like a member of the public. This guy could have been anyone, but he's just lost to history because Spiro and Cullen decided not to obtain this guy and, and say, look, detain him and say, can you tell us who you are and, and question him? He was allowed to run off. But they both say they saw Mark Chapman standing there, docile reading the book, and they saw Jose Padermo. And Jose Padermo said to the cops, this guy just shot John Lennon, right? So Spiro goes up to him, he's thinking, well, he looks like a banker, he looks like a, you know, he doesn't look like a killer. He's reading the book, but okay. Cullen goes into the concierge's area, goes through the vestibule doors, up the stairs, into the concierge. he sees Lennon, probably dead at this point, definitely bleeding out. He comes back out into the driveway and says to Spiro, there's definitely a guy been shot in here, arrest that guy. They cuff Chapman, who allegedly at the time, by some reports says, I'm the only one which again is a very strange thing for a man to say, but that's allegedly what he said by some reports. At this point, two other officers turn up, officers Fraunberger and Palmer. They rush into the back, into the concierge's area. They rush into that back office. They see Lennon there. Fraunberger says he didn't see Yoko Ono, which is very strange. He's adamant she wasn't there. Palmer says she might be there. He can't really remember. So it's a bit weird where Yoko was at this point. They go up to John's body and they look at him and they think, mm, this guy's pretty dead. Now, according to Fraunberger, he took um, John's pulse and he said he could feel a pulse. Now, this doesn't go with what all the doctors and nurses and medical officers said that he was dead on impact, but we'll go with what Palmer said. I don't actually think John had a pulse at that point. Jay Hastings said he heard a death gurgle a few minutes earlier and he was absolutely convinced that John was dead. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty certain that John was there. But anyway, they decided to pick up his body, Fraunberger and Palmer, officers Fraunberger, and walk his body out into the driveway and put his body into another police car of an Officer Moran into the back of that car. They didn't want to wait for an ambulance. They thought it would take too long. And Officer Moran drives off to the Roosevelt Hospital. And Moran is one of these officers who's given a little, a little apocryphal story, which I think is complete BS. He basically said he turned around to John in the back of his car and said, do you know who you are? And John says, yeah, I'm John Lennon, which is just, there's just no way that happened. But Moran wanted to throw that one out there. And uh, some people say that's the last thing John Lennon's ever said. It's complete BS. Um, at this point, Yoko turns up on the scene and says to Framberger and Palmer, can you drive me to the Roosevelt so I can be with John when they take him to the hospital? So they drive him off. They drive Yoko off behind Moran's car Framberg and Palmer, Yoko in the back. They all go to the Roosevelt where they try and save John Lennon's life and they can't save John Lennon's life. And John Lennon is announced dead to the media around about 11, 10 p.m. Now that is the official narrative. Pretty much fixed, standardized, never questioned. That's if you read every single official book, every single, every single uh, newspaper article, magazine article, if you see every single film that's been done, that's how they want you to think it went down, okay?
what's the first and now for somebody who doesn't know too much about this robbie i'd be interested to know what what are the first red flags that you think are, are sort I of just popping think up there someone tried to give an official statement like john lennon's been shot then someone asks a question and the next thing you know you get this crazy story of him walking with like uh all these heart you know issues <laughs> i mean and i mean the falling on the desk thing i don't I mean, if his body was there, unless that's just statements being said, I don't know if there's any proof that his body was there on that desk. Um, I would when it wasn't that... on the desk, it was it was in the back office. It was it was kind of behind the desk. There was an office behind the desk. Yeah. And then be- beyond that office was another office, a back office. That's where his body was allegedly found by everybody. So it's allegedly found. It's not like it was proof that his body was there well, well, on the I, desk I, or I t- anything. I'm, I'm pretty certain it was found in that back office because Framberger and Palmer say it. Uh, Hastings says it, um, Cullen says it, and a, and a guy called Jack Henderson who came down at a, a kind of resident, he gave a statement and said, yeah, John's body was lying in the back office. But here's, here's the first anomaly. Now you've talked about blood and offices and where he was, which is a good thing to pick up on, Robbie. Um, Joe Manny, the lift operator, after he's taken the gun away and he's hidden it, he comes back up, as I said, into the Dakota again, into the driveway a second time. He says he comes via a different route, but anyway, he gets to that driveway. And he goes into the concierge's area and he says two really interesting things, Joe Manning. First thing he says is Jay Hastings, the concierge's shirt was covered in blood, like literally covered. It was just red. It was, it was a white shirt, but he said it was red. And he assumed because of that, that John must have somehow fell into Jay Hastings' arms. It, he, he thought it was the only kind of feasible way that so much blood could be on Jay Hastings. And then Joe Manning says another really interesting thing. He says in the front office, in Jay Hastings' concierge's office, the one that John ran through to get into the back office, the office behind the desk, the office with the window out to the, out to the driveway, he said there was a pool of blood in that office. So Joe Manny assumed by looking at this scene, by seeing this scene as he came upon it, he just assumed that John must have somehow fell into Jay's arms, fell down on the floor in the front office, bled out a bit to have this big pool of blood. And there is an image that you can find on my Instagram that does look like a pool of blood in an office, but whether that's the front or back, we don't know. And Jay and Joe Manny thinks, well, somehow Yoko and Jay Hastings must have picked John's body up and moved it into the back office because he can't figure out why that pool of blood was in the front office, but John's body was in the back office. So that's anomaly number one. That that does put a very large question mark over Yoko Ono and Jay Hastings, uh, the concierge, because they're both adamant. Yoko's always said that John kind of staggered in. He said he'd been shot to her. He said to Yoko, Yoko said three times that John said to her, he's been shot. Look, I don't trust is, Yoko. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, well, it's a bit it's a bit strange that he that she said that three times. And she's also, let's get into Yoko. Yoko has given five different statements at the time in the day, in the in the night of the, on the night of the murder and the days after the murder. Each statement is different. Each statement, sometimes she says she was in front of John, sometimes she said John was in front of her. Sometimes she says that they were kind of a cross paths. She was in front and John He's was in pulling front. pulling a good old Marine Oswald, huh? Changing up the story. Yeah, she totally changes the story all the time. And she gives a different statement. It's almost like she's covering her bases. Now, this could be PTSD. It doesn't have to be something that was, you know, nefarious. She might just be trying to piece together a shocking event and getting it wrong each time. But it's a, it's a bit weird that she said three times on three occasions that John said to her, Christ, I've been shot. I think she said he said once and I've been shot. But it always seems in the statements that she gives that John's kind of surprised. And she always says, really importantly, Ronnie, that it was only after he went inside the glass doors that John said he was shot. He didn't say he was shot outside in the driveway. She says when he's inside those glass doors and in, on the stairway vestibule area, which is which will become very important shortly. So Yoko is, is a person of, of great interest. And I think with regards to, you know, whether there's anything nefarious with her, we, we, I don't think we're ever going to get a official statement from Yoko anymore she for, for decades she does not want to talk about the murder she's always said it's too painful too difficult after the initial statements that she gave to the lead detective and I, I have to point out how I know this I in my investigation I got to know the lead detective quite well Ron Hoffman and he basically offered to sell me all his notebooks and his paperwork so I got a media lawyer friend of mine to fly out to his home and we got all his family there, so he wasn't. We weren't exploiting an old man, and we got all the family to agree. And we basically, I basically purchased all the paperwork and all his notebooks and all his uh, all his ramblings from the investigation. And he was the lead detective, and he interviewed everybody, which is why I know exactly what Yoko Ono said 
uh, not only on the night of the murder, but in the days after the murder. So she is a person uh, of great interest. And I would really like to have a definitive statement from Yoko Ono about exactly what she saw. But the one thing Yoko Ono has never said, ever, in those statements back then and right up to this present day, is that she saw Mark Chapman shoot her husband. She just didn't say it. And in fact, in Ron Hoffman's notebook, it says Yoko Ono was there. She did not see her husband get shot. Yet in some of the statements she gave, she alleges that John said to her three times that he'd been shot, which is what Jay Hastings said he heard. But if you listen to the medical people, John wasn't going to do that. That wasn't going to happen. So let, let's get to the medical people now, Robbie, because this is really where it starts to get really interesting. So when I first started doing this investigation back in 2020, one of the things I really wanted to do straight away was, was get down to the medical nitty gritty. Because as you know, with the JFK and RFK assassinations, and even with MLK, you can learn a lot by seeing you know, what happened at the hospital and what the doctors and nurses said. So the first doctor who kind of came to prominence as allegedly treating John Lennon was a guy called Stephen Lynn. He's the guy I spoke to you about earlier who came out to the media after John was announced dead. And you can see him on many video YouTube clips. He's got a moustache, got a pristine white coat, by the way and says, John Lennon's dead, we try to save him, blah, blah, blah. Now, Stephen Lynn did not try and save John Lennon's life, but sadly for 30 years, Stephen Lynn went on every single documentary and, went on, and was featured in every single magazine and newspaper article as the doctor who tried to save John Lennon's life. And famously, he's always saying, I was the one who tried to pump John's heart with my own bare hands. He didn't do any of that, okay? The, the actual doctor who did that was a guy called Dr. Halloran, who we'll get to shortly. But Dr. Halloran, for some reason, for 31 years, wanted to stay in the shadows and he allowed Stephen Lynn to go out there and just spout this crap. And the problem with that was Stephen never went into specifics. He never talked about entrance and exit wounds. It was always this dramatic pumping his heart and doing all he can. And he kind of used to see John in New York and he felt he had a connection with him and he just kept on embellishing, embellishing. But the problem was because Stephen Lynn was the guy who took on this mantle as the doctor who tried to save John, nobody dug any deeper. They just thought, well, this guy, has got nothing really nefarious to say about it. So there must be nothing nefarious going on in the medical. It must all be as, as we were told, shot in the back, blah, blah, blah. So I knew Stephen Lynn was a liar. He was in the room, Stephen Lynn. It's really important this. One of the nurses rang Stephen Lynn when they were trying to save John Lennon because Stephen Lynn was the head of the ER department. So they felt they should ring him and say, look, Stephen, Stephen had gone home a few hours earlier. And I said, Stephen, we've got John Lennon in our ER room. We're trying to save him. Do you want to come down and, you know, talk to the press so Stephen rushed down to the hospital and he was in the room he saw John's wounds but he stood in the background and as you can see from his white coat when he came out to talk to the press uh when John was called dead you know Stephen Lim didn't have any blood in his hands he wasn't pumping his heart and you know Dr Halloran and the two nurses who tried to save John have all told me Stephen Lim did nothing he just stood there observing but he did observe and he did say many times that John must have been dead on impact very important point. So I decided to talk to another doctor, would you believe, Robbie, a doctor called uh, Frank Veteran, who also said he tried to save John Lennon's life and has been in documentaries and magazine articles. So I thought I'll give Frank Veteran a call. Now, Frank's big thing is he always says that John was shot all down his left side. Uh, sorry, down his left side. So I thought, that's weird. That's not shot in the back. So I spoke to Frank and he gave me a one hour chat about how he tried to save John N's life and he thought John looked like Jesus and he thought John looked like JFK and it took him years to get over this traumatic event and it was just such a big moment. He remembers blood dripping on his Adidas trainers. It, it was The detail was incredible, but something was off, Robbie. I just thought something's not right here. It just doesn't quite add up. So after I spoke to Frank Veteran, I thought I'll try and talk to Dr. Halloran, you know, the doctor who came out in 2011 and said that he was a doctor who led the efforts to try and save <coughs> John Lennon. So I rang Dr. Haller and I managed to get through to him. This is very early on in my investigation. I've got to know Dr. Haller really well now. But then I just sort of said, look, you know, I'm looking into this, spoke to Frank Veteran. And the first question I wanted to ask Dr. Haller was, there was a film brought out, Robbie, in 2016 called The Lennon Report. And the whole point of this film, the whole purposes of this film was to get to the bottom of the merry-go-round in the doctors and nurses who treated John, who didn't treat John. So they thought they'd do a dramatic reconstruction. They would get Dr. Hannah and the nurses involved as consultants and try and tell the real story of what really happened in the Roosevelt when John was brought in and they tried to save his life. So I said to Dr. Hannah, and I said, Dr. Hannah, the first question I want to ask you is, why wasn't Frank Veteran in the Lennon report? 
you know, you were in there, Nim was in there in the background watching. It looked pretty authentic. You know, why wasn't that veteran there? He said, well, he wasn't there because he, he wasn't in the film because he wasn't there that night at the hospital. He, he, he wasn't there helping us save John Lennon's life. So like Lynn, this was another guy who just decided to insert himself into history. And again, it, it, it just clouds, it just muddies the water. And, you know, veteran like Lynn has, has made it very difficult to get to the truth about the medical for over 30 years. So I spoke to Haller and I said, OK, that, that's quite shocking. And the, the next question I said to Haller and Robbie was, so just tell me exactly, Dr. Haller, where exactly on um, John's back was, um, was Mark Chapman's bullets? You know, where, where did it, where exactly on his back was he struck? And I'll never forget this moment because I knew at that, you know, at that point, Robbie, my life was about to change. He just said, Dr. Haller, well, he wasn't shot on his back. He was shot in his front. He was shot in his chest. And I remember thinking, yeah, but everyone says he was shot in his back. And he said, well, everyone's wrong. He says he was shot with four bullets in his upper left chest area, above his heart, ripped all his, you know, all his veins and arteries around his heart to pieces. Um, but there were four entrance, entrance wounds because he knew he was a very experienced surgeon at this point. He said there were four entrance wounds, upper left chest, and three exit wounds out of his upper left back in a direct line of fire, no moving around. He could see that the ones going in the front were coming out directly at the back. And I remember th sort of thinking to myself, this is, this is shocking because we've been told something completely different. It's very much like the JFK play. You know, we're told he was shot in the back, but he was actually shot in the front. So it had all these disturbing echoes. A bit like RFK, we were told he was shot in the front, but he was actually shot in the back. You know, they can never get these entrance and exit wounds right. So I sort of said to Dr. Haran after a little chat with him, I said, well, you know, did you realize that Mark Chapman was 25, 30 feet away from John Lennon? It, it was a kind of dark, dingy driveway. He wasn't up close. He said, no, he had to be up close. He said he had to be up close and he had to be in front of him. He said the only person who could get that kind of, and I quote him here, tight professional grouping uh, above John's heart had to be one or two feet in front of John, maybe three feet at most. And it had to be a, a guy who knew what he was doing with a gun and he had to be facing him. He said he couldn't be behind him. So I said, well, that's what everyone says. You know, we know where Chapman was. He was, he was by the street. John was a long way away from Chapman. We know this as well. He said, well, even, he said, even if John turned, he said, not even a Navy SEAL could hit him with that kind of tight professional grouping from that distance. He said, it's impossible. He had to be right up close in front of John. So I just thought at that point, for the first time ever, Robbie, I thought, is there a sec is this a second shooter scenario playing out all over again? Is is there something else going on here? So I, I said to him, look, how can I get this verified, Dr. Hannon? He said, well, talk to the two nurses who helped me try and save John's life. Talk to Barbara Camera, nurses Barbara Camera and nurses Diatra Sato. Talk to them. They'll they'll tell you they, they were there helping me try to save his life. They saw the wounds. So I spoke to the nurses and they said, yep, they were there. Uh, Deatra Sato was there initially with Dr. Haran. She helped cut John's clothes off. And when someone comes in with gunshot wounds, what they do, Robbie, is they cut the clothes off, they turn the body, front, back, front, back, checking. All, the whole body, naked body, making see where the, you know, it's, it's, it's the standard procedure, where, where, where are the wounds? And De Deatra Sato confirmed what Dr. Haran said, four upper left chest, three out the back. They both assumed that the one that didn't pass through the back was the one that was nearest John's shoulder, upper left shoulder. So that was good. Then Barbara Camera came along to help the assistants, uh, to help Deatra and, and Dr. Halloran and another doctor called Richard Marks. And she said, yep, four in the front. But here's where it gets really interesting. And here's why history is going to love these nurses, because it was their job to wash John and shroud him after they called his death. So Dr. Halloran tried to save John's life for about half an hour. As, as we know, he tried to pump his heart with his hands and he cut an incision and they tried all kinds of different procedures to try and get a job. But they said, basically, it was a Hail Mary kind of procedure. He had no pulse when he came in. They, they were, you know, it was, they knew it was, it, it was an uphill struggle. So the nurses take John's body away. They wash John's wounds, okay, Barbara and Dee. And they can see up close, no blood, no surgical stuff around him, that there's four upper front, three out the left back. So they see that, they shroud John and they leave his body waiting to go to the morgue in the, to go to the morgue that night that was going to be picked up and taken to the morgue. And from the morgue, it was going to go to the chief medical officer's department that next morning. 
a guy called Elliot Gross who was going to do the autopsy. Okay, so that was the standard procedure. So they were just waiting for it to be picked up next to the morgue. Then what happens, Robbie, is a guy called Elliot Gross turns up, who's, an, who's a chief medical officer at the time, who just got the drop, job uh, at the start of 1980. Okay. Now, this is a guy who's had multiple accusations of falsifying autopsies. Okay. This is a guy who's actually apologized for getting autopsies wrong in the past. He's never actually been convicted for all these multiple accusations, but he's had a lot of accusations of being a very dodgy chief medical officer. But he turns up in the hospital. Okay. Now, this is the guy that's going to get John's body the next morning to conduct, conduct the autopsy. So he walks in and he goes up to Barbara and Dee and says, I'm Elliot Gross, chief medical officer. I'm here to look at John. I want to see John's wounds. And they just couldn't believe he was saying this. They were saying, well, why, why would you say that? You know, you're going to get the body. Why do you need to see them now? He's shrouded. It's disrespectful. You know, you'll get the body in a few hours time. But Elliot was in a real rush a real rush to see the wounds. And he demanded that they unshroud John so he could see the wounds up close quickly. So what Elliot did was he stood there while they unshrouded John. He walked around John's body uh, silently, observing the four in the front, three out the back, and he walked out. And the, nurse, and the nurses were furious because John was starting to bleed out again. But what this did was this horrible, macabre, very strange, suspicious activity by Elliot Gross. What it did do, though, Robbie, it gave the nurses yet another chance to see John's wounds up close. And they are both adamant to this day that John had four in the front, upper left chest, three out the back. And it had to be somebody standing in front of John two or three feet away. And it had to be an instant death. John would have collapsed instantly because all of his you know, arteries were, were, were mashed up. Now, here's another interesting point, Robbie. Remember, Mark Chapman's supposed to be using hollow point bullets. Hollow point bullets famously do not pass through a victim. They stay in a victim. That's why, P that's why the NYPD use them, because it doesn't pass through a felony into an innocent member of the public. But remember, three of these bullets went directly through John. That's not what hollow point bullets are supposed to do. They went in and they went straight out the other side out of his back. So we know now that John was shot in the front from someone close up, and we know Chapman was standing behind him 30 feet away. So you could say, and it was said by the NYPD, even though it doesn't quite fit with their in the back scenario, that John turned somehow and Mark called out his name. So the Mark calling out to uh, John Lennon became a bit of a kind of um, new addition that was added to the narrative very early on. And they had to do this, I think, because they realized that four in the front and three out the back is going to cause him a bit of problems by saying that someone shot John in the back. Now, we know John didn't turn around for quite a few reasons. Reason number one is Mark Chapman has never said he's called out John Lennon and, and John turned around. It, 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 if he did do that, why would he not say it? You know, it's, it's kind of, does it matter? He shot him in the back or front? Mark doesn't care. It, it, he, to him, it's, it's you know, point. He, he said he shot John. Why would he care if he turned around? So Mark's never said that. Yoko Ono, and you can see this on my Instagram, Assassination of Venom. Yoko Ono, I've, I've put a page from the detective's notebook where she actually gave this statement, said that they heard a noise in the street, but they never turned around. OK, so she said they never turned around. And in, in all her other statements that she gave, those other five that I told you about, she never mentions Mark Chapman calling out to her husband and she never mentions turning around. Also, Jay Hastings, the concierge, who was listening to what was going on in the driveway, he said he never heard Mark Chapman call out to John Lennon. And even if he did, let's just say, discarding all of that evidence, that John did somehow turn around and face Mark Chapman and allow him to shoot with four bullets in his upper left chest. What, what they're asking us to believe here, Robbie, is that John turned around to a guy that he didn't know, a stranger. He stood there facing him, and he allowed Mark Chapman from 20 to, 20 to 25 feet away to get off five shots in a chamber. So this is not an automatic weapon. So there would have been a slight, you know, split second gap between each shot. Bang, 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 bang. Hitting him four times. John stays dead still, does not move, okay? Because he'd have to be to get that tight professional grouping. And then after this is done and his heart's been ripped apart, they're asking us to believe that John then turns back around again, walks up to the vegetable door and goes on that crazy magical mystery tour I told you about earlier. It's just hogwash. It's absolute hogwash. So whether John turned around or didn't turn around, 
he wasn't shot in that driveway. And this is getting to the real crucial point of the murder here. I just want to say before you give any spoilers to the ending there, it feels like he was shot in that office or which, wherever they found the, the pool of blood was, if he was shot inside somewhere and then someone just moved him. That, that, that is possible. But the detective actually gave the game away to me, Robbie. He said to me when I interviewed him, I think it was probably on the third or fourth interview, and I've had lengthy, lengthy chats with Ron Hoffman. And I think Ron knows he's not done a good job. And I think there's a slight, I think the reason he sold me all his paperwork was because I think there's a slight bit of guilt there and he wants the truth to get out. But he, I said to Ron, I said to Ron, I said, Ron, where was, where, where was John shot? Where, where, where was he actually shot? In what location? Where's the geography? And he just said, oh, he shot in the stairway. He was shot in the stairs, 100% shot in the stairs. And then I found a clip, which you can find on my YouTube channel, Assassination of Lennon where Ron actually says it to a news crew outside the Roosevelt Hospital. Now, it's a bit of rushes. It never actually made, tellingly, it never made broadcast this clip. It was, it was from news, some news writers that thankfully found its way onto YouTube. And Ron says quite clearly to a reporter in a very agitated state that John was shot inside the vestibule, not outside. Now, the thing is, Mark Chapman, Robbie, could not see inside the vestibule, never alone shoot someone inside it. He, it was completely out of his line of vision. He was outside that vestibule, 25, 30 feet away by the street. It, it's impossible for John to be shot in the front, in the vestibule by Mark Chapman. So the second shooter had to be either in that stairway area, which no one would have seen him, by the way, or her. No one on the street would have seen them there. Or as you say, he was shot, John was shot beyond the stairway in the lobby front office. But then if that's the case, then Jay Hastings has got a lot of questions to answer. So it's it's one thing's for sure, Robbie, and I'm absolutely convinced now. By the way, John Lennon was not shot by Mark Le by Mark Chapman, but Mark Chapman believes he did this. He's had some kind of psychotic episode, and is there something we can go in into book, Catcher in the Rye? Well, let's get into that. I mean, we'll, we'll get into Mark in a little while. I think just to finish up on the on the murder scene. Um, there's also other evidence that John was shot inside the vestibule on the stairway. Yoko Ono has said twice that, and two of her statements, that it was only after had John gone inside the glass doors, as she calls it, that he then said, oh, I've been shot. And Yoko also says that the bullet holes in the glass doors, which I'm about to talk to you about, they came after gunfire, okay, which is weird. So if you've got Mark, let's say, out, let's just say as a theory, if you go with the Siram Siram shooting blanks theory that Lisa Pease has, has, I think, very credibly put in her book, A Lie Too Big to Fail, about the RFK assassination. Uh, we can go into that a little while longer. But yeah, she goes with the, she goes with the blanks. I know there's a lot of people who don't believe that, that there were blanks being fired. But I, I can see either way. But if you go with that, if Mark's shooting blanks, all attention is going to go on to Mark Chapman. OK, which is, I think, the point of a patsy shooting a gun. You don't look at what's happening to the actual murder. You look at where the where the noise is coming from. So everyone looks at Mark. Everybody sort of goes towards that particular guy. The a second shooter, who I believe was almost certainly in the vestibule stairway area, potentially using a silencer, could shoot John without John even knowing. John's in a very small, dark area, walking up some steps. If he pumps him with four bullets in his upper left chest area going for the heart no doubt and then john turns around to yoko and says my god i've been shot he probably didn't even realize it he sounded from the statements that yoko gave john seemed surprised that he was shot like christ i've been shot what, what how did that happen and then you get these bullet holes in the glass festival doors now what's interesting about these bullet holes robbie is there's another really interesting anomaly about the case the glass festival doors there's two doors and they go like that right you've got this one here which Mark Chapman could see by the roadside. You've got another one that kind of goes like this that Chapman couldn't see. And this was up against the Iron Gate that was out of Chapman's sight, okay? Now, what's interesting about these glass vestibule doors, Robbie, is there are two bullet holes in the one facing Chapman on the street, two bullet holes through the glass, glass panels. And there's another bullet hole, which you can't really see very well, but I've seen the images of it now, in the other glass vestibule door. But what's interesting about these bullet holes is two things that are really interesting, Robbie. They're low down. They're kind of lower back, sort of waist height. They're not upper back. They're not the bullets that pass through John's upper left back, okay? So they, they can't have been those bullets. If they were, they would have gone through John's upper left back and dive-bombed down into these, into these windows. 
But the, the one that's in the far vestibule door, which is behind the door that Chapman could see, how that bullet hole got there is impossible for Chapman because it would have had to have gone through John and somehow done a kind of boomerang around the back of the vestibule door and gone through it to actually cause that hole because the doors, the doors weren't parallel. They were like that. They, they were kind of like a triangle. So it, it, it's not like one door was facing the other. So if a bullet went through one door, it would go through the other door. That's not how those doors were. They were like that. They were kind of at a right angle. So it's impossible for Jack Chapman to shoot through one and then the bullets pass through the other. So they were three different bullets. There were three different bullets passing through those doors. OK. And what's really interesting is, Robbie, I've spoken to the police and the Dakota workers who were there. I've spoken to Jay Hastings, Joe Manny, Framberger, Palmer, Hoffman. I've spoken to everybody and they've all said no blood. Those glass panel vestibule doors had no blood splatter around those bullet holes. They were completely clear. So to me, that's someone shooting into those glass doors, okay? And the bullets passing through those doors, potentially hitting John, but probably not, because we know the bullets that hit John weren't lower back. They were upper left chest, upper left back. So those bullet holes, Robbie, shouldn't be there. They, which, whichever scenario you go with, they don't fit. They're in the wrong place. And I can only see the only credible scenario I can see. There's two credible scenarios. One is Chapman Woods shooting live rounds, which I believe would be hard to hard did, to kind of anybody, go with. Did anybody check what a, I was about to look up on my phone, but what a starter pistol, yeah. how many chambers it has? Well, we know the gun had five. We know the guy gun had five chambers. Chapman, yeah, I've, never, is, I've never heard of a fiver before. That's what I'm saying. Usually it's six. I've never heard of anything really less than six. Yeah, but. yeah. There, there, there is a, a quite a popular point, a point thirty-eight revolver uh, that does have five shots in it. They, they used to call it a fiver back in the day. So I think that I think the gun definitely had five bullets in it. It may have, listen. We don't know, Robert, because the gun, when the police turned up to arrest Mark Chapman, he didn't have a gun on him. The gun wasn't there. The gun was down in a drawer. You know, we have to take Jose Padermo's word for it, that the gun that he kicked to the back of the driveway and Joe Manny picked up was the gun that Mark Chapman was allegedly using. So the gun is always going to be a bit of a mystery. But those bullet holes should not be in those doors. And there's, there's no feasible way of explaining why they're there, other than perhaps a second shooter in the vestibule shot John four times and missed with three shots and three shots went through the vestibule doors. A, a, a shooter in the vestibule stairway area, shooting down into John and the vestibule doors, he easily could have missed John three times and put three bullets through through those doors. So let's let's get onto the bullets now, Robbie, okay? Now, now these things all seem to, if you don't mind, I can get into the bullets now. The one thing, the one thing that's not in the evidence vouchers, and I've got all of them from Ron Hoffman, is there's no spent bullets, which I found really strange. It's like, well, Surely there's going to be some spent bullets because we know one bullet, according to the doctor and the nurses, stayed in John, but three went through him. We know for sure three went through him because they said there's three holes in his bank. No spent bullets. So I said to Ron Hoffman, did you collect bullets at the scene? And he was very vague about it. And he was like, mm, yeah, I think so. Can't really remember. I know there were five empty shells in his revolver, but I can't really go into the bullet. I can't really remember. I'm assuming we did, but hey, who knows? So I thought, okay, I really need to get into these, this bullet situation. So I started to look into the evidence, Robbie, and I found a morgue receipt, okay, which was put together by Elliot Gross and his team. But it was actually signed for by a detective at the NYPD. So it wasn't signed for by Gross. So it's potentially a more valuable document for me because I don't actually believe anything that comes out of Elliot Gross's office because of all the accusations he's had against him. But anyway, th this, um, this receipt says there was one SWC bullet found in John and one lead bullet. So I thought to myself, why have they described two different bullets? Now, a semi wad cutter bullet can just be an ordinary lead bullet, by the way. And a lead bullet can be a hollow point bullet. So it doesn't just, it doesn't mean there's anything nefarious here. But I just found the fact that they were described differently interesting. So I thought, okay, I need to, I need to look further here. And then I got lucky. There was a photographer called Brad Trent, a New York photographer, quite, quite well known, quite successful. And in 19, I think it was 89, he was um, offered a gig by Life magazine to take photographs of famous guns in history, okay? And he was asked to go and take a photo of the gun that Mark Chapman allegedly used to shoot John Lennon. So he 
Life magazine arranged with the New York ballistics department for Brad to go and photograph this gun. So Brad went down there and he said it was chaotic and it was all a bit kind of loose. And he was surprised how he was allowed to be alone in a room with this gun. You think it was, you know, be a valuable historical document, never alone a criminal one. But they were very loose about it. And he took a picture of the gun. But there was also a little um, envelope with two bullets in it. OK. And in this envelope, there were two bullets. Now, one bullet looks very much like a hollow point bullet because it's mushroomed. Spent hollow point bullets always mushroom at the top. And this one's definitely mushroomed. So it's definitely a hollow point bullet. The other bullet, though, just looks like a normal lead bullet. There's no mushrooming. And then I looked at a little description that was put on the envelope that probably Elliot Gross put. And he put one lead bullet and then he put one lead SWC in brackets, hollow bullet found. So there I had the evidence, Robbie, that there were two different types of bullets that were found at the autopsy of John Lennon. One was a hollow point bullet and one was a non hollow point bullet. And you can find this image. This image is actually online. It's on my Instagram. Brad put it on his blog. Thank goodness. So the world can see it. It's been hiding in plain sight, this image for over 10 years now. And it leads to the fact that there potentially there were two different types of shooters with two different. Now, Mark Chapman could be using two di two different types of ammo in his in his revolver that is possible you can in a 0.38 revolver use a non-hollow and a hollow at the same time it's rare and sometimes it puts the aim of the gun off but it can happen but here's the thing mark chapman is adamant and he was a security guard who used guns before he's adamant he was using hollow point bullets the nypd are adamant it was hollow point bullets the da's office have always said in many documentaries he used hollow point bullets now you think those the NYPD and the DA's office would be absolutely certain, wouldn't you? They'd have done an investigation of what bullets were used to kill John Lennon. Yet we now know that one of the bullets that was pulled from his body was not a hollow point bullet. It was a normal lead bullet, which to me smacks of a second shooter. That's what I was about to say. Yeah, two different types of ammunition come from two different guns. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So... You know, what, at this, at this sorry, what's, Robert, the, what's the purpose like with Mark Chapman, the catcher in the rye, this whole thing that's going on with him? Is that the purpose to make him seem even more crazy? I mean, was he in on it? Has he ever confessed that there was a conspiracy or anything like that? Or he's just been OK with being in jail? Well, let's let's get to that. It's really interesting. Um, Chapman, uh, we, we could be here all day talking about his weird life. Uh, I, I'll give you the highlights um, and we'll lead up to the catcher in the rye. He was never interested in the catcher in the rye when he was a kid. And, he, and when he was, a, I've, I've spoken to all his friends, no, never read the book. After the murder, there's a writer called Fenton Bresler who wrote a book. And he said that every single journalist in the world literally went to Mark Chapman's hometown and spoke to all his friends and family and said, was he interested? What, where did his obsession with Catching the Rye come from? And they all went, he was never interested in Catching the Rye. He never spoke about it. He was never interested in John Lennon. He wasn't particularly bothered about the Beatles. He was more into Todd Rundgren. You know, he, he, this is like, there was no John Lennon obsession. There was no catching the eye obsession. And that's very important. So to keep that thought in mind. So the, the key points to Mark Chapman is he's born in, in, uh, in a Southern Georgia town. He has a military dad. There's always a military dad. He has a, a nurse mother, a sort of average middle-class kind of home, not particularly loving, quite distant and cold, the parents by all accounts. He had a sister who he wasn't particularly close to. Uh, the, big, the big thing for Mark Chapman was when he was about 15, he got into LSD heavily, big time. He, he started taking mar the usual thing, marijuana, marijuana, speed, LSD. Didn't take heroin. Many people said he was a heroin user. I've spoken to all the people who took drugs with Mark Chapman. He was not a heroin user. That's just complete BS. But he did get heavily into LSD. So around about sort of 15, he's, 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 he's kind of... Um, He's one of these guys, Mark, who's desperate to please, desperate to get in with the in crowd, but always getting it wrong, always saying the wrong thing, never quite cool enough to kind of hang out with the cool people. But Story desperate. of my life. <laughs> Story of many people's lives, I think. So that, that's kind of Mark, which means I think it's made him quite malleable and made him quite easy to influence and easy to kind of, I think Mark would kind of, and even Ron Hoffman said this, he's the kind of guy who was desperate to please and he'd do anything to please and to kind of get into a, a kind of, a feeling of belonging because there was no love at home clearly so mark was kind of always looking for something so after his kind of lsd binging kind of months uh there was a guy who turned up into how are we doing for time hey, we're okay there was a guy who turned up in his um at his school a preacher called arthur blessed 
I think it's called Bless It. Yeah, Bless It. Made up name for sure. And he called himself the psychedelic preacher. Okay, so his, his kind of thing was, don't get high on drugs, get high on Jesus. That was his kind of shtick. And Mark and his friend went to see this guy, okay, who was doing a, 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 you know, a sermon. And um, he, was, he was into charismatic Christianity, this guy. So, you know, you know, the one where you sort of touch people on the head and they, they fall back. And I'm healed. They, yeah, they speak in tongues, and you know, you know the guys who you know, send me twenty dollars. Sam you know, Kinison like was one. Yeah, yeah, the TV evangelicals that you know were so popular in the seventies and eighties. Those guys. You know, so they started like, cults, and the world started going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the, the the Lord is in my fingers, and I'm going to heal you with the Lord's power. All that crap. They call it charismatic Christianity. I didn't know any of this until I started researching it. So he was a charismatic Christianity guy, and Mark and his friend went along to just have fun and joke around with this right that was their plan they were going to go there and they were going to go up to the front and when when arthur put his hand on mark and his friend's head they were going to pretend to fall back and be struck by the power of the lord that was the whole idea of this visit so the friend went up there he doesn't he, this guy wants to be renamed anonymous so i'll just i'll just say he was one of mark's best friends a guy he took a lot of drugs with he said he went up there and the hand went you know arthur put his hand in his head and you know feel the lord and he fell back giggling and laughing went back to his pew Mark did the same thing. The hand went on Mark's head and he fell back. But when Mark came back to his pew, he said, uh, he, you know, his friend was going, wasn't that hilarious? My God, I can't believe people fall for this. And Mark turned around to him and said, actually, something happened to me up there. I, I felt the spirit of the Lord. And after that point, Mark got heavily into Christianity in, in a really big way. And um, he kind of, uh, he became what's called at the time a Jesus freak. So he'd kind of go around with a big wooden cross. It was a big movement at the time. And um, he was really annoying everybody by trying to convert them whenever he spoke to them. It became an beater. obsession. Yeah, yeah, a real obsession, apparently. A very annoying obsession for a lot of his friends. He lost a lot of his friends. He got into the YMCA. He got into... Um, oh, Jesus, not the YMCA. Yeah, yeah, he got into the YMCA. Yeah, he did. And... Um, We'd like to know what he did with the YMCA, but they're refusing to release his records on confidentiality grounds. But yeah, he did a lot of work with the YMCA. He did a lot of work with Vietnamese refugees in a camp where some people said uh, it was being monitored by the CIA. Uh, but he did a lot of sort of Christian good works uh, at the time. But he was kind of not happy, not settled. But at that point in his life, Robbie, he was starting to hang around with a guy called Dana Reeves, who was a couple of years older than Mark. And Dana... Dana became a cop, but at that point, he was a security guard. And Dana was the complete opposite of Mark. He was into guns. He was into rough housing. He was into fighting. And everybody said he was a really dark, malevolent kind of figure who Mark idolized and looked up to. And Dana, for some reason, gave Mark a room in his house to live at. And Dana kind of became Mark's uh, best friend in the world. And this would have been around about sort of 15, 16. And everybody was just kind of like saying, well, well what the hell are these two doing together? You know, they just, Dana should not be hanging out with Mark. And what does Mark see in this guy? Dana is the guy who famously got Mark his hollow point bullets, uh, allegedly to shoot John Lennon, which will, uh, which we can probably get into later. But basically when Mark went to New York the first time to shoot John Lennon, he rang up Dana and said, can I come down and get some hollow point bullets allegedly to help him fight off muggers in New York. But I'm pretty certain Dana knew what those bullets were for. I'm just giving you a heads up. We'll be doing another podcast together. I can tell you that much. I'm going to do some deep research on this to give some really good points, but uh, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad you're getting intrigued and, and I'm really glad you, you, I'd like to know more about the YMCA. That's part, part of research that I've not done a lot of work into. So if you've got some stuff on that, that'd be fascinating. But anyway, so let, let's get this as fast forward a bit. So Mark, Mark's hanging out with Dana. He's hanging out with the refugee camp. He's doing some YMCA work. And then in 1977, completely out of the blue, where Mark is, what would he have been? He'd have been 22. He decides to go to Hawaii. Just, he's going to drop everything. He's just going to leave his life in, 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 in Georgia. He's going to leave Dana and he's going to fly to Hawaii, where he said afterwards that he, was going to, he wanted to go there to kill himself because he felt his life was just at a loss. He couldn't really cut it in life. He was a bit of a loser. He couldn't hold down a girlfriend. He wasn't sure about how faithful he was to Christianity. He just he just felt a bit of a loss. Just before he went to Hawaii, I should also point out, Robbie, he went on some a very mysterious trip to Beirut on behalf of the YMCA to do some missionary work there. 
And by all accounts, there was a war at the, at the time in Beirut. And he spent two weeks allegedly in his hotel room listening to this war and gunfire outside his hotel. And then he came back to Beirut and talked about it with his friends as something that he was very proud of. What he did in Beirut is still very much unclear, but that Beirut whole trip was strange. But we'll, ju we'll just part, there's, there's stranger trips to come. So basically, Mark goes to Hawaii. Uh, to cut a long story short, he tries to kill himself. He does a very bad job of it. He uses a hose pipe in a car. The hose pipe's not particularly well connected to the, to the exhaust, and it falls off, and he kind of doesn't quite kill himself properly. Allegedly, a Japanese fisherman walks by. This all sounds completely BS to me, but this is the official story. And the fisherman finds Mark, and he then finds himself um, in front of a psychiatrist in Hawaii, um, a lady called Judy Herzog. And she says, uh, you need to go to a mental uh, facility, a psychiatric hospital, to you know, get evaluated. Now, she takes him to a hospital at the other end of the island, a place called Castle Memorial Hospital, when there was plenty of other psychiatric hospitals nearby that she could have took him to. But for some reason, Judy drove him many, many miles to the other side of the island to go to this Castle Memorial Hospital, which had only recently set up a psychiatric unit. Now, what's interesting about the Castle Memorial Hospital, Robbie, is it was run by the Seventh-day Adventists. Now, anyone who knows about the Seventh-day Adventists will know that they do, they've done a lot of work in the past for the military by, by offering up Adventists as human guinea pigs for medical experiments by the military because they had a lot of conscientious objectors in the Korean War and the way they got around that was, yeah, they don't really want to fight, but you can use them as unit guinea pigs. And there's documentaries been done on this, how the Seventh-day Adventists, you know, shockingly gave up so many lives to, you know, allow the American military to do all kinds of horrible experiments on them. So Louis they had Shuron a kind of... West was um, the MK Ultra doctor who visited Jack Ruby, who, if you look up his Wikipedia, that was his credit, was Korean War victims. Um, we use biological weapons over there. And these people said that, oh, they're brainwashed, thinking that we use biological weapons over there because it was banned. So we would have been breaking code. And uh, Joy on West had unbrainwashed them by making them forget using biological weapons over there. Uh, and I'm sure that was all done in a very ethical fashion if Julian West was part of it. You know, what a fantastic, ethical, great man he was. Possibly one of the darkest individuals in history, really, that guy. Oh, but anyway, so, so Mark does stuff. At the castle memorial we're not quite sure how they treated him there's there's all kinds of um apocryphal stories of different kinds of treatments with drugs and stuff we don't know they're of course obviously they're not revealing anything for confident confidentiality reasons apparently they've lost some records as well on mark but yeah we don't know really what they were doing with him but what we do know is after about six months they were doing so well with him he became a member of staff and he became a janitor for the uh, seventh day adventists and they kind of took him under under their wing and then after about a year working there, Robbie, he decides, Mark, that he wants to travel the world. This is a janitor, okay, on a minimum wage. And the funding that he gets to travel the world is via the Seventh-day Adventist Castle Memorial Hospital uh, credit union office. He basically goes to them and says, can you loan me some money to travel all around the world? And I'm talking all around the world here, Robbie. He went to the Far East. He went to India. He went to Europe. There's not many countries Mark didn't go to. He went everywhere often staying at YMCA facilities, allegedly. Uh, apparently, even he even went to a United Nations meeting with, the, with a YMCA um, chief in Switzerland, but that's another story. So basically, they say, oh, sure, Mark, even though you're a janitor, you've got no collateral, we're going to give you this enormous sum of money. We don't know you're ever going to pay it back, but don't worry, off you go, Mark. You fly all around the world. We don't know what you're going to be doing all around the world, by the way, but you know, you've got to have a great time. So Mark does this, and he visits all these countries and there's lots of photos of mark love to know who took those photos in all these different countries so we know he did this he then came back and started a relationship with a woman called gloria rabe who's a, a woman of japanese descent and um very similar to yoko ono uh gloria then became mark's kind of new dana reeves in a way she was always by his side she started to work at the castle memorial hospital as well very convenient very cozy they traveled to work together they lived together so Gloria was kind of, um, yeah, she, she was Mark. She, to this very day, if you want to get to Mark Chapman, you have to go through Gloria. Gloria controls Mark's access to the world and, uh, and the world's access to Mark. Um, what's interesting about Gloria is I approached her once very early on and sent her an email and said, um, look, I've got lots of anomalies in your husband's murder. Can we have a chat? I'd like to tell you about them. And she emailed me back and said, uh, I've prayed with Mark about your request. I didn't ask her to talk to Mark, by the way, but she obviously told, allegedly told him. I prayed with Mark about your request and I've decided not to go forward with your request and I won't be talking to you. And I just thought, that's a very strange thing for a loving wife 
to not want to know what anomalies I've got about her husband's conviction and John Lennon's murder. But anyway, we can go into Gloria another time. She's a very interesting lady. Um, so basically, let's fast forward now, getting up to the murder here, Robbie, because I know we're running out of time. Um, August 1980, all right? Mark's living with Gloria. Uh, he's doing various security jobs. He's left Castle Memorial Hospital now. He's come under the wing of a Presbyterian preacher pastor called Pete, Pete Anderson. And there's lots of these uh, Southern Presbyterian preacher pastor type figures who are connected to Mark Chapman. Pete Anderson was just one of a long line of these guys. Very interesting guys. Uh, and Pete was kind of controlling Mark and not really allowing him to go out and socialize and doing all the hellfire brimstone stuff on Mark. He was becoming very religious and very radical, very almost like a Christian fundamentalist at this point under the tutelage of Pete Anderson and Gloria, who Gloria has now at this point switched to be a, a kind of fervent Christian. She did this apparently by a, a group called the Navigators, which is a Christian group on, in Hawaii at the time who were connected to the military. They did a lot, of, they do a lot of military stuff and they, they're the ones who converted Gloria, which I find quite interesting. And um, Gloria, strangely enough, used to be a completely different person. She said this online in an interview where she was a travel agent. That's how Mark met her. She set up Mark's round the world trip. She said that she was into kind of like black magic and, and sort of very dodgy, nefarious sort of things. And she had quite a promiscuous life as a travel agent and kind of Mark and the navigators and Christianity came into her life and converted her. So Gloria's got a very interesting backstory that we don't really know too much about, but she's still a person that I would very much like to talk to. But let's fast forward to August 1980. For some reason, totally out of the blue, Mark gets obsessed with capturing the ride. He's got the book. He wants Gloria to have a copy of the book and he wants to call himself Holden Caulfield. And he is just suddenly all in. This book is the meaning of life, according to Mark. There's another book Mark gets into in August 1980. And it was a book about John Lennon. Uh, and it was basically about how John's having this ostentatious life. And Mark, Mark got the book from the library, apparently. And he sort of started to fuse in August 1980, Robbie, the, the phonies that you'll find in Capturing the Right with John Lennon being a phony. And the two things start to fuse in his mind that Capturing the Right is all about, you know, Holden Caulfield, the main character, is all about calling out the phonies in the world. And Mark is starting to see John Lennon as the, the main phony in the world. Now, what's really interesting about August 1980, Robbie, two other things were happening at the same time. You had Ronald Reagan was pretty much a shoe in to win the election in November. He was kind of so far ahead in the polls by August 1980 that they kind of knew Reagan was going to be coming into power in August, in, in, in January 1981, uh, six months later. And then you had John Lennon, who had just started to go into the studio for the first time ever and, and make his comeback after five years in the wilderness. John Lennon went back into the recording studio and he was getting back out into the mainstream world again. So you had all these, you had Reagan coming into power, Ray, uh, Lennon suddenly becoming a public figure again, and you had Mark Chapman fusing Catcher in the Rye and a John Lennon book with John Lennon as a phony. And Mark has said many times from this point onwards, it became a compulsion in his mind, a runaway train, a thing he could not stop that made him want to kill John Lennon. It just, it came, it wasn't some kind of lifelong obsession with John, that's BS. It wasn't something that kind of like slowly, it just happened like that. August 1980, mission kill John Lennon was instigated in his brain. It was all bound up in this capture in the Rye book that was kind of inspiring him to do it. So he tries to do it at the end of October, early November, he flies out there, rings up Dana Reeves, his old pal, says, can you give me some hollow point bullets? The official narrative will say that he said to Dana, can you um, give them for muggers? But I'm fairly certain that Mark and Dana knew exactly what those bullets were for. For some reason, it doesn't happen. Mark stays outside the Dakota for a few days. He decides he doesn't want to do it. He goes back to Gloria. He says he throws his capture in the Ryan novel away, which I find it very interesting. But when he, he sort of aborted his first obsession with killing John Lennon, with throwing that book away, because I think the book was the thing that was going him to do it. He told Gloria what he was doing. He said, I went out there to kill John Lennon. Gloria decides not to tell the police about this. She decides not to tell psychiatric services about this. She decides to keep this quiet. So in early December, when Mark decides to fly out to New York again, Gloria doesn't see any red flags in this. And she drives him to the airport and says, yeah, off you go and do whatever you're doing in New York, Mark. I'm sure it's fine. I'm sure there's nothing you're going to be doing in the sun towards. I'm sure it's not that. John Lennon compulsion assassination thing you told me about last month. 
I'm sure that's nothing to worry about, Mark. I'll drive you to the airport. Off you go. Be a good boy. So Mark flies off and uh, and the rest is kind of history. He buys a catcher in the Ryan book on the morning of the murder. He stands outside the Dakota. He gets his record famously signed by a very dubious photographer called, called Paul Goresh, who has been officially sold as a kind of lovable rogue who became good friends with John Lennon. He's nothing of the sort. He was a rapacious Beatles memorabilia collector who was taking pictures of John and getting autographs to make money. Very dubious individual. Um, and then Mark is waiting there at 10.45 p.m. that night when John and Yoko pull up outside the Dakota and the rest we talked about earlier about how Mark thought he did something, Robbie, um, that we now know from medical evidence and forensic evidence and from testimony from people on the ground and the detective who was leading the, the case that John was shot in an area of the Dakota in an area of his body that Mark Chapman could not feasibly have done. So then you have to kind of say, okay, if he's having a psychotic episode here, Robbie, if he's thinking he's doing something he's not doing, perhaps he's kind of hypnotized, perhaps he's under some kind of trance. Is there any, talking to Jolene West, is there any MK Ultra kind of hypnotism connections to Mark Chapman? And oh boy, is there a connection? <laughs> Wait till you hear this. So Mark gets arrested. He gets put in a cell. He gets given a public attorney to defend him, a guy called Herbert Adlerberg. After two days, Herbert Adlerberg uh, leaves the case, steps down because he, he's got a lot of death threats on the phone. So they conveniently got Herbert out of the way. And another lawyer moves in to defend Mark, a lawyer called Jonathan Marks, who works out of a building called 30 Rockefeller Plaza. Now, Jonathan, which is a very salubrious building, um, Another law firm that were working in 30 Rockefeller Plaza was a law firm called Donovan, Newton and Irvin. Now, that law firm, Donovan, Newton and Irvin, was founded by a guy called Wild Bill Donovan. And as you, as you know, Wild Bill Donovan is the guy who created the CIA. And there's still a statue of good old Wild Bill in the CIA foyer in Langley. So Wild Bill had his office there and it was a wash, Donovan and Newton, with CIA spooks, some present, some past. In fact, William Colby, would you believe, the ex-CIA director even worked at Donovan Newton. So it just goes to show you how CIA intertwined that law firm was. Now, a lawyer who worked in that law firm, a lawyer called David Suggs, was hired by Jonathan Marks to help him on the Mark Chapman case. So you've got a direct link there to Mark Chapman's defense team and a CIA law firm. That you could not get a more direct link. Now, I'm not saying Jonathan Marks and David Suggs are nefarious characters. They may have been kind of duped into getting certain experts into Mark Chapman's cell, but that was very much how this was done. So the first thing Jonathan Marks decides to do, and you can see a New York Post headline, it was on the front page, Mark Chapman to be hypnotized. Um, Jonathan Marks went to the press and said, I'm going to get a hypnotist to go into Mark Chapman's cell and hypnotize him to see you know, if we can figure out what Mark did and how he did it, and more importantly, why he did it. Because Marx was going for a temporary insanity plea, and he was trying to, why he went for a temporary one, I don't know. Why he just didn't go for insanity is, is an interesting point. But he was kind of gonna use these experts to figure out what was going on in Mark's mind. Now, the first expert he got in was a guy called Milton Klein. Now, Milton Klein, a year earlier in 1979, was on an ABC documentary about MK Ultra where he boasts in this documentary that he was the guy that was hired to figure out the Manchurian candidate aspect of MKUltra. He was specifically the guy that was hired to create a killer, a murderer, to uh, take someone out and not realize they were doing it. And he actually boasts about this in this documentary a year before Jonathan Marks hired him, would you believe, on TV, uh, that he's a CIA consultant working on MKUltra. But this is the guy, or one of the guys, that Jonathan Marks puts into Mark Chapman's cell to have unmonitored, unfettered access to Mark Chapman. The very same guy that, that was hired by the CIA to create a Manchurian candidate for MP Ultra. Almost unbelievable. The second guy they put in was Bernard Diamond, a name I'm sure you know very well, Robbie, the guy who was working on Siran Siran on the RFK case. He happens to waltz into Mark Chapman's cell as well. Now, here's the thing. For six months, they're going to go for a temporary insanity plea, okay? And they decide at the last minute, Chapman rings up 
Chapman decides, he rings up Jonathan Marks out of the blue and says, I've decided to plead guilty. And Marks allegedly goes, well, why are you doing that? He said, well, God told me, a little, little voice inside my head whispered in my head that I should plead guilty, which meant that everything I've just told you for the last two hours, Robbie, about the forensics and the medical and all the ways that Mark Chapman couldn't have possibly done it, could never be hurt in a court of law. He was going to go straight to jail, which is where he is today. So I took that at face value that a little voice called God spoke in his ear. But I've done a bit more digging and Mark went for an appeal in the mid 80s. And in that appeal process, it came up, it was a bit clearer about exactly why Mark decided to plead guilty. The reason he decided to plead guilty was it wasn't just a little voice from God inside his head. I need to roll back a bit. So when Milton Klein was in his cell, we know from a journalist called Jim Gaines, who was a big propagandist for the official narrative, Jim Gaines in the 1987 piece gave some details about what Milton Klein said to Mark Chapman in his cell. What Gaines said was, he said, Klein spoke to Chapman, and Klein was the first person to do this. No one else did this before. Many people talk about this now as something that Mark always had, but it, it first came to prominence through Milton Klein. And it was about a little people kingdom that Mark Chapman had in his head. And he had this kind of, he was the kind of supreme leader and he, there was a government and he had like this little people army and they had like a little people kind of admin area. And, and, and he had this kind of little people universe that Mark had in his head. And this is something that Milton Klein first spoke to Mark about. So clearly Milton Klein put this concept into Mark's brain. And I remember when I first read about this in 87 in, in Jim Gaines' article, I thought, well, it's not, it just sounds stupid, it just sounds silly. It sounds like something they made up. But the reason I think Milton Klein did this was, is Mark Chapman pled guilty, not because God whispered in his ear. The reason Mark Chapman pled guilty, and I found this out now, is on the night before he decided to plead guilty, a, apparently a battle took place on his police cell floor, would you believe? where there was the little people from God and the little people that were representing the devil. And they had this mass battle in front of Mark that he was imagining, no doubt, putting his brain through Milton Klein, on, on his floor of his cell. And this epic battle was going on. And God's little people won this battle. And the general for God's little people got up into Mark's hand and whispered into Mark's ear, plead guilty don't go to trial, plead guilty. And that was why Mark rang up his attorney the next day and said, God has whispered into my ear and said, I need to plead guilty. And that little move that Milton Klein, I'm sure did, meant that nobody would ever find out the truth about John Lennon's murder. It was really important that they got that, that kind of, they, they couldn't say that the capture in the rye made Mark plead guilty. They couldn't say Mark just suddenly had, a, they had to have some kind of spiritual dimension to make it kind of more, more feasible because what was also happening at the same time, Robbie, was there was a lot of preachers and pastors piling into Mark's cell, some quite nefarious, I believe, who were trying to tell Mark that he was possessed by demons. Now this possessed by demons thing is something that was put into Mark when he was 15 by another Southern Presbyterian preacher who was a, a who also you won't be surprised to know at this point had a sideline in hypnotism. What was incredible back in the seventies was uh, Robbie was there was a, a an organisation, a federation, who basically tried to fuse religion and hypnotism as a kind of good thing. They even had conferences where they talked about this. One of the main players in that movement was a preacher slash hypnotist who messed with Mark Chapman's mind when he was fifteen. This is all documented. We don't know. I'm going to reveal his name in my book. But this guy is a very interesting character, and I think this is where. When Mark was 15, they started to groom him to believe that he was possessed by demons and, and the devil was making him do it. Because after Mark pled guilty through the little people mechanism, they needed to find another reason why Mark shot John Lennon. They couldn't leave the capture in the rye reason. Because if you look into Salinger and his background, there's a lot of intelligence, military, operation paperclip kind of baggage that comes with capturing the rye. And I think they wanted to kind of sweep that away, especially when a copy was found in Hinckley's hotel room in 1981, when he tried to assassinate Ronald Reagan. So they needed to find a new reason that they could kind of hang Mark Chapman's motive on. And I think the reason that was implied into his mind was demons made him do it. And there was a horrific two to three year period in Mark's cell after he pled guilty, where 
he was put under this kind of gaslighting uh, scenario where he was made to believe he was possessed by demons and constantly people were trying to exercise these demons. Incredibly, even a prison guard tried to do a DIY exorcism on Mark. There was even someone who tried to do a remote exorcism outside Mark's prison cell and, and kind of, you know, Mark said he remembered sort of writhing on the floor and this bile coming out of his mouth and and he had red lights in his cell and he was he used to pray. To, it, it, they based, I'm pretty sure it was a kind of two to three year, uh, very deliberate uh, operation to get Mark to believe that he was possessed by those demons that they put in his brain when he was 15, back back in those days when he had that charismatic stuff going on. And, and they kind of wanted to bring that forward post Lennon murder to use that as an excuse that Mark could sort of hang his hat on that actually it wasn't some kind of nefarious programming that made me kill John Lennon. It was the devil and I was possessed by demons. And now those demons are out of me. I can now become a good Christian and there's a credible reason. What's happened over the years, the demon thing has been slightly pushed to one side and now it's kind of, he did it for fame, did it for glory. So if, if you look at reasons now why Mark Chapman allegedly killed John Lennon, it's either some kind of demonic possession, which leaves a lot of people uncomfortable. So if you're not happy with that reason, don't worry, Robbie. He did it for fame. Let's go with the fame thing. This is a guy, of course, who gave up the trial of the century, by the way. If he, would, if he went to trial, he'd have been the centre of the trial of the century. But he decided to give that up because a little general that Milton Klein put in his head told him to do so. So when, when, you've, when you put all these things together, Robbie, it just becomes, it's, it's up, the evidence that something really nefarious went on in that driveway and the evidence that Mark Chapman was a groomed program assassin, it, it becomes overwhelming, Robbie. It, it becomes, and I've done now on my Substack, um, davidwhelan.substack, if you go there, I've, done, I've put 20 articles down there now, Robbie, and I've laid out a lot of the evidence now. And I think one of the really important ones is, is an article I, I, I put called Mark Chapman Unplugged, where this is the first statement he gave to the police at the 20th precinct station, probably about an hour after he was arrested. So no one, there's no Milton Kleins, there's no preachers, there's no Glorias, there's no Dana Reeves. It's just Mark immediately after trying to figure out what he's just done. And if you read that statement, which I've managed to get hold of, and I put the whole statement on my Substack and I've analyzed it. It's a guy who just doesn't have a clue, Robbie, what he's done. He's kind of like, I don't know. I, I kind of, I didn't have anything against John Lennon. I didn't have anything against the Beatles. I don't, I don't know why I did it. Um, I don't really remember doing it. I kind of, I kind of remember maybe aiming, but I don't remember aiming. He was there, but then he wasn't there. I looked down, I had a book in my hand. Apparently the gun got knocked out of my hand, but I don't remember that. Padermo told me to run away, but I don't, you know, I, I, I'm confused. And it's not the statement of a cold calculated killer that we've been told went there with hollow point bullets, which we know now weren't there, uh, to kill John to, to acquire fame, or he did it because he was possessed by demons, if you want to go with the other theory. So it's, it's to me now, Robbie, after doing this for three years, it's, it's, it's just absolutely clear to me now that it was an operation where there were, there were four components. You had to groom Mark from a very early age. And I think if you've got an LSD aid old guy who's desperate to please and desperate to get in with the right crowd. And is open to being manipulated by preachers who are hypnotists at the age of 15. That's, that's perfect kind of fodder really to get him on a, on a Manchurian candidate program. I think you've then got to kind of get him all the way through different programs. And I think obviously his, his work with the Adventists and his work in Hawaii, which is obviously a wash in military installations. I think a lot of the sort of prepping was done in Hawaii. I think when Lennon was going back into the recording studio and Ronald Reagan was issuing to win the presidency, I think that's when the um, catcher in the rye, John Lennon obsession was programmed into Mark's brain. I think it malfunctioned in, at the end of October, early November, where he aborted and came back. And I think it was reinstigated again. And I think you also need three other components. You need to have a second shooter operation on the ground. And I think 10.45 p.m. on a Monday night when everyone's watching football, I think when, when he was there October, November, when he was there in the few days leading up to the 8th of December, I think he would have been shot earlier. But I think everything had to be right. There had to be nobody on the streets, nobody in the driveway, nobody in the concierge's office. I think all the different elements had to be 
you know, there had to be no one there, no witnesses for it, for it to go down. And when it went down, it was the perfect time for it to happen. And obviously you had to have a second shooter there to do the job. That was clearly done in a professional manner, a, you know, a tight professional group. And they were going for his heart. I suspect the bullets were collected by the shooter. Um, certainly no spent bullets have been found by the NYPD that we've been told about. You then need an NYPD, Robbie, to not investigate. OK, I know that didn't happen because I've spoken to people at the coach who said the very next morning they were mopping up the blood in the office. Not quite sure it was the front office or the back, but they were mopping up the blood. They were also opening up the driveway again, would you believe, that very next morning for people to come and go into the Dakota. So there was no men in white suits. There was no sealing off the area to collect little bits of evidence. It was kind of nothing to see here. We've got our guy, mop the blood up, open this place up. Let's just get on with it. So that happened. You had an NYPD who weren't doing their job. You had a DA's office who clearly weren't doing their job. But then again, I suppose the prosecuting DA's office is not going to do their job because they want to prosecute. They're not going to look for anomalies. You've got a lawyer who has a, an assistant who works for a CIA law firm. That couldn't have helped. You know, whether they deliberately or inadvertently were given these CIA experts like Milton Klein to put in March out himself, we can't get away from the fact that this happened. And after it happened, Something that those CIA consultants put in Mark Chapman's mind led to him pleading guilty. We can't get away from that fact. And then you've got the final piece in the jigsaw, Robbie, is a media who shamefully, for 42 years, 43 years now, have not bothered to look into what I've just looked into for the last three years and interviewed the doctors, interviewed the nurses, interviewed the detective, get hold of the paperwork, look into the bullets, look into the forensics, look into Mark Chapman's background, you know, and all, all they did was what most people do, Robbie, is they've been obsessing about the last thing I need to discuss with you tonight before we go is the doorman, Jose Padermo, you see, because if you look online for Mark Chapman, John Lennon conspiracies over the last 20, 30 years, everybody obsesses about the doorman. And the reason they do this is in 1987, you know, I told you about a Jim Gaines journalist who spoke about Milton Klein going into Mark's cell. He also spoke about Jose Padermo for the first time. Because for seven years, from 1980 and the murder to 1987, till Gaines's People magazine article, no one knew who Jose Padermo was. His name was, was blank. It was, he was just called Dorman. No one interviewed him at the time in the media. He gave no interviews to the radio. He was just this kind of weird, strange guy that no one kind of... In fact, Jay Hastings, the concierge, was often called the Dorman, so people often got it confused. But when Jim Gaines decided to reveal to the world that Jose Padermo... The doorman at the night of Dakota, when John was assassinated, was called Jose Padermo. Gaines added a few more little bits of detail. He said that Jose Padermo was an anti-Castro Cuban. Red flag. He spoke to Mark Chapman about the JFK assassination. Red flag. And he spoke to Mark Chapman about the Bay of Pigs. OK, so everybody went, wow, anti-Castro Cuban, Bay of Pigs, mm, JFK. And you know as well as I do, Robbie, there's an awful lot of theories about anti-Castro Cubans being involved in JFK's assassination, right? So you can see it and Bayer Pigs as a reason why they wanted to take JFK out because you think of air support, you know the story. We won't go into that now. So people suddenly started to put two and two together. But then when they found out, Robbie, that there was an anti-Castro Cuban working for the CIA in a brigade called Brigade 2506, sometimes called Operation 40, this group of people, and this group of, of killers, CIA contracted anti-Castro killers, right-wing killers, were run, were run by a guy called Jose Padermo, who fought at the Bay of Pigs, they went, well, it's got to be Dakota Jose Padermo. My God, there's a, there's a CIA assassin running an assassin group, Bay of Pigs, and people just got, well, that's it. The case is closed. Jose Padermo must have done it, or he must be involved. But it was the ultimate red flag, Robbie, because I started to look into it, and I found out that the Jose Padermo from the Bay of Pigs was born 20 years before Dakota Jose Padermo was born. And I found out that Dakota Jose Padermo started to work in 1969 and finished his work in, I think, 2010. So he was working there for 11 years before John Lennon was assassinated. Now, I just cannot believe that the Jose Padermo, who was a kind of assassin's assassin, a guy who was in charge of a group of assassins, would want to work the door at the, at the Dakota, opening car doors for people for 11 years, waiting to be in place for a John Lennon assassination, when in 1969, 
John Lennon wasn't even living in New York. He was living in London. He hadn't actually moved to America at that point. So when Jose started to work at the Dakota, he wasn't put in there as a plan to take John out in 11 years because John was nowhere near New York at the time. He was living in the UK. So they're clearly two different people, Robbie. Dakota Jose, Bayer Pigs Jose, Padermo, different people. But what, yeah, but what Gaines did was he laid down the ultimate red herring. That's what he did, Robbie, because everybody still to this day, there was a guy, a journalist, uh, I think Phil, Str Phil Strong, when his name was, he wrote a book about it where he lays down, oh, yeah, Dakota Jose Badermo was a bad pigs guy. Whole book. No, wrong. You could have, you know, you, I spoke, you know, we, I, I've been in contact with Jose Badermo's family. Two of his boys worked at the Dakota after Jose retired. Jose's brother gave Jose the job. So we know pretty much everything about Dakota Jose Padema. What we don't know, though, Robbie, is, and there are still some questions to ask about Dakota Jose, even though he's not that Bay of Pigs guy, he is still a guy of interest because his statement is one of the few witness statements that we've never been allowed to see. For some reason, the DA's office won't release it to the public, which is quite suspicious. They've released most other witness statements, but not that one. And you kind of, his actions on the night of the murder, kicking the gun, not picking it up, it's it's all a bit strange. And we know he said to Chapman, because Chapman said it, you know, get you know, get out of here, run away. But we also know he said something else, Robbie. Another witness, a woman called Nina Rosen, I only found this out recently, double backed when she heard gunfire, looked into the Dakota driveway. So we're probably talking five to ten seconds after gunfire was heard. Okay. She was very close. She saw Chapman and the and the doorman by the roadside, by the way, not near the vestibule. She didn't see John because we know he's in the vestibule at this point, possibly bleeding out from being shot in the vestibule. She didn't see a gun. There was no gun. She saw Yoko in the courtyard screaming. So Yoko's behind John, probably saw more than she wanted to see, I suspect, but saw Yoko. But she also heard one other thing, Robbie. She heard Jose Padermo say to Mark Chapman, not get out of here, run away, but you better leave now. The cops will be here soon. Now, why would you say that to a docile guy who doesn't have a gun? She said there was no gun, no gun anywhere in sight. He just had his book. Why would you say that to a guy? The cops are coming, you better run. It's almost like a warning to get away. I don't understand why Jose said that, but Nina said that's exactly what he said. So I've got a feeling, I've got a theory that Paderma may have been involved. And if he was, I think Mark Chapman wasn't meant to stay there in that driveway reading a book. I think that was a malfunction. I think he was supposed to run. And I think he was going to get taken out when he ran. And I'm pretty certain if he did, a la Oswald style, get taken out of the picture, you don't need to worry about putting people like Milton Klein into his cell and brainwashing him to think that little gods are whispering in his ear to do this, that and the other. So I, I think Chapman was a loose end. And I think it was a loose end that probably caused him a lot of problems. Because if, if he did run and he was taken at Central Park, which is across the road, would have been very easy to have someone take him out. A police officer, you know, a, a dodgy cop could have took him out. Who knows? They could have got rid of him in lots of different ways. But at the end of the day, Jose Padermo, there are still questions to ask about Jose. We don't know all the, all the facts about that guy. And if Mark Chapman was triggered to think he was doing something he wasn't doing, i.e. shooting John Lennon, because we know he couldn't shoot John from where he was and with the wounds that John had, it would have been quite handy to have a trigger person next to Mark to get him to do that at the right time. And Jose would have been the perfect guy to do that. I need a deep breath now, Robbie. <laughs> no, David, you've given me enough of your time, man. I'm definitely going to have to have you back on here once I can do some more research about some of this stuff as well, too, to ask some more informed questions. But I really do appreciate the time you laid out. I mean, three years of research, too. But that, good God, man, that was amazing. Um, that's a lot Thank too. You. I'm gonna have to listen back multiple times, just be able to soak yeah, up all the information, but it's a lot to process, man. I mean, if, if you go to my Substack, I just want to put a shout out to that David Whelan. That's W H E L A N at Substack.com. Uh, yeah, uh, there's all the articles are there. Um, my book's coming out at the end of the year. Give me some truth. The assassination of John Lennon. Um, you can go to my YouTube assassination of Lennon. You'll see lots of video clips of Ron Hoffman telling you he was shot in the in the vestibule you can go to my instagram assassination lenin where you'll see images of those doors those bullet holes in the doors and stuff like that it's all out there now robbie i've laid it all out um i think once you read all that sub stack once you read those 20 articles and you soak up all the videos i have spoken to a lot of people who are skeptical about this initially friends and family and and and, and even podcasts that i've spoken on recently and they've gone well i came in skeptical but actually now you've told me all that and I've seen all the evidence because I've put evidence out there. There's documentation that I've put on Instagram. 
they go, yeah, it, it had to be, it had to be an operation. It's it's not what what we were told. It had to be something nefarious. Um, there's still a few little pieces I need to fill in. I still love to get Padermo's statement. I've got a rough idea what Padermo did, and I, I put that on my Substack. But th there are still a few little holes. Chapman to this day still thinks he did it. Still thinks he did it for the glory of God, and he's he, 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 he's a strange character, Chapman. I'm still not sure whether he was groomed and completely hypnotized, or whether he was partly involved. It's a little bit like Oswald, really. It's that kind of how much did he know? Did he know there was a second shooter? Was he there? Was he coerced to be there to be the patsy? I, I don't think MK Ultra at the point where Mark in 1980 was doing what he was doing was to create a Manchurian candidate assassin. I think it was done to create a Manchurian candidate patsy. And I think he was only there to be the patsy. And I think he was only there to think he was doing something he wasn't doing. Because I don't think if they were going to take John out with an operation, they would risk Mark Chapman shooting wildly with hollow point bullets. I think they needed to have someone in place, in a concealed place, to take John out once John had rushed in after hearing gunfire in the street. And, you know, it was the perfect place to do it. Um, and that's where the cops, that's where the lead detective said it was done. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm convinced now that's where John was shot. If you want to go with the official narrative and John Lennon was a zombie who got shot, fatally with four bullets around his heart and then got up and went on this magical mystery tour and spoke to spoke to Yoko, said I've been shot, and spoke to the concierge, said I've been shot. I mean, it doesn't have to be nefarious with the concierge, by the way. You know, he, he you know, a lot, it's, it's gonna, it's not, doesn't look good for Joe by saying that he saw John running in and John said to him he'd been shot. It looks like that puts him in a bad light. He, but what I found on this case is people just embellish, Robbie, and just make up stuff. So many people make up stuff and add things so they can be more you know involved in a dramatic story so maybe you know maybe john was shot on the stairway there is some evidence up which i put on my substack that padermo the doorman lifted john into the lobby and i suspect jay hastings might have just invented that story of running past because maybe jay and yoko moved john into the back office and they were guilty about doing that that potentially could have killed him by doing that and they probably you know didn't want to talk about john collapsing in the front office uh, so, you know, people make up all kinds of stories to cover themselves or to make themselves more in a story than they believe. So it's not always it doesn't always lead to a nefarious outcome that someone is not telling the truth. But clearly, Padermo, Hastings, Ono and Manny, they're all their statements don't match up. The four people who were there, apart from John, nothing they say corroborates with each other. So someone's lying. <laughs> Whether they're lying to big themselves up or whether they're lying for more nefarious reasons, I'll let I'll let the public decide. But hopefully, Robbie, one day there'll be a new investigation into John's murder, and we can, um, you know, we can get a proper uh, a proper result and a proper analysis of what really happened. I'm glad there's researchers like yourself out there, at least doing the work um, when it comes to trying to solve this thing out there. I think it's really important. It's like the same reason I'm interested in the Kennedy assassination. I'm not, I don't have all my breakdown details like you do about the Lennon one, but, uh, damn, if I didn't just get sucked into the Lennon assassination from all, <laughs> all that, um, I'm sure we'll have another podcast. Um, I'd love to have you back. Sure. On if you want to come back. Sure. On. Um, let me do a little bit of research myself and try and look into some stuff, but I'm going to link all your links in the description. David, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Thanks everybody. Listen, episode about blank podcast.